Your YouTube feed is crap. Stop wasting your time watching bot-boosted shills and self-appointed gurus cloying for your attention. Instead, join the Goslings interview, live stream, and podcast. The Goslings, a dark lit digital speakeasy of free thinkers, a super chat of radical truth-seeking wizards who eat trolls for second breakfast. Topics that'll make your mama's hair stand on end. Ideas that'll make your pastor's knees knock. Guests that will illuminate the hidden chambers of your mind, and interviews that strike down the darkness. Welcome to the Goslings. <laughs> I'm a little ticklish I'm on the ticklish. inside. <laughs> hey, everybody! Welcome. Greetings. I'm Jonathan. I'm Nick, and we are the Goslings, and we have an awesome interview guest for you guys today, um, Nick. You yes. Wanna sort of do a little preamble. We can do the toast and then get rolling. Absolutely. We're absolutely. starting a little late today because we had so much fun talking to. Yeah, him. we were uh, <laughs> we're chatting so, with our guest who is waiting sorry. live uh, in the background. We're going to bring yeah, him on in just in a wings. second. Oh yeah, we are super excited about this. Uh, we'll do our toast here in just a second. Uh, before I get too far into this, just so I don't forget, because I'm oh. horrible at this. Yeah. Don't forget to subscribe. We love you guys, yes. uh, and we want to Does continue help. bringing you amazing guests with great, relevant yeah. yet kind of fringe topics that people keep oh, yeah. asking questions about no one yeah. seems to want to talk about it and we need answers yeah yeah a so. lot of questions that uh, a lot of people don't want to ask but they scratch at the back of your brain yep well we are the back scratcher we <laughs> just go in there <laughs> we are the and back just scratchers. hit that spot that's you know? right so. that's right <laughs> you can find us of course you're probably watching this on youtube you can also find us on rumble and uh the podcast version on spotify uh and you can buy super sweet t-shirts as well i'll pull this up here yeah. we can talk about this more later we got t-shirts we, we designed some new ones last week. Yeah, so, some alien themed T-shirts are amazing. Yeah, some pretty relevant ones yeah. to today's guest, also. Yeah. I think as well. I so, think so. And then, um, and we're on Instagram. Um, yep. Nick Goss writes. Yep. At Nick Realms Realms novels. Yeah, that's us right here. We'll put this up there. Boom. There we are. At Nick Goss writes and at Heavenly Realms novels. Uh, without further ado, let's do our toast. Yes, on to the toast, Nick. This is sort of this has been your idea and your baby. So if you want to do the toast, I would be on it. Initiate absolutely. Raise your libations. What are we drinking today, by the way? Is it uh, this is actually it's called uh, Tennessee Black and Tan. Oh yeah, it's yeah. from H. Clark just down the road. Oh yeah, Local. great. Yep. I got an interesting story about that, by the way. Uh, okay, I okay. went to the opening. Anyway, oh nice. Okay, yeah. all right. Take up the broken sword of your father and strike down the darkness. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, yeah. So, okay, before we bring our guest on, real quick. Real quick. This this story. I went to the H. Clark Distillery Grand Opening yep. in 2015. Yep. And uh, there was a former Miss America there. I think I may have mentioned this before. I can't remember. Uh, you get her number? <laughs> no, she was. There was a ring. Never mind. So, I know. Yeah. As, as much of a mercenary as I may be, when, you know, the ring's there <laughs> for a reason, that's that's your cue, boys. Understood. Walk away. Um, no, but uh, she was very lovely. She was very smart. I asked her what her pet cause, her cause du jour was, because mm -hmm. all of those girls, they all have. It's, and it's always like, yeah, save the whales or the puppy dogs. <laughs> I want to feed, you know, whatever the tribes that no one's ever heard yeah, of. Yeah. Well, this chick, then this is 2015. So this is before all the stuff that mm -hmm. came out. You know, she said um, sex trafficking. Ooh, and I went, uh, yeah, because back then that was no were, one knew about it back then. Yeah, turns out, according to her and her involvement with law enforcement, uh, Nashville is the it's a hub. hub. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, because yep. we have three major interstates. We have yep. the river. We have the railways. Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, it was a very illuminating conversation. And and as the years progressed, and we started to learn more about these secret societies mm -hmm. and what these people do and what they have been doing for a long time, mm -hmm. and how all this plays into you know the biblical narrative of mm -hmm. these things behind the scenes. Uh, it it bore out. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. wild. Yeah, so, very wild. That's yeah. why we keep our kids on leashes. Yeah, it's fair. They're that's twelve fair. And, and ten, but you know, still, well, you never know. They make pretty big leashes these days. So. <laughs> yeah, child tracker five thousand. That's a South Park joke. But that's also a good reason to uh to check out this interview because one of the the guests we have today has a great book out 
uh, mm-hmm. several books, and uh, he's a huge um, personality in the sort of in, this uh, in that space of Christian esoterica mm-hmm. and uh, arcane, you know, a Christian and conspiracies. He helps and, us understand the past, yeah, so that we can interpret what's coming in the future. Yep, exactly. Yep, and uh, extremely relevant. We adore him and his work. It's awesome. Nick, take Let's it. bring him on. The one and only, the author of the Second Coming of Saturn. Yeah. Uh, also a member of uh, Scott. If you if you look up the name Derek Gilbert, yeah, you're gonna find a ton. He's an accomplished author. He and his yeah. wife Sharon, uh, they are fantastic, and uh, we have the pleasure of talking with Derek today. So yeah. without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, the, the man himself of dissemination, <laughs> <laughs> Derek Gilbert. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, Derek. Oh, oh fellas, it's an honor to be here, and uh, what an introduction, boy! I love that. Uh, that was. Uh, <laughs> You hit you hit all the right notes. Oh, thank yeah, you. Well, thank you, much. Uh, you know thank what? You Coming much. from someone with a you know with a background in broadcasting like you, that actually like really helps yeah. sort of you know, <laughs> ease the anxiety yep. of like, oh my gosh, am I screwing this up? How bad am I screwing this up right now? <laughs> <laughs> On a scale of eight to twenty. You know? <laughs> well, thank you for taking time. I mean, it's Memorial Day weekend, and uh, you agreed to do this interview, and uh, yes. we got a ton of questions. Of course, we've read your book. Yeah, and uh, would like to. F- First of all, tell us about the, the about how did you come up with the second coming of Saturn? What's it about and what inspired you to yeah. write this book? The book really derives from the research that Sharon and I have been doing for uh, the last seven years, ever since we moved to the Ozarks and, and partnered with Skywatch TV. Yeah. And God bless Tom Horn for encouraging us in this because uh, a lot of this stuff is... Um, as you say, kind of fringe or esoteric, but the deeper we dug into the connections between Greek and Roman mythology, or what's called mythology, really their religion, and the Bible, the more overlap we found. Yeah. And I, I was fascinated, and been fascinated with the, the concept of the Nephilim ever since hearing uh, hearing this preached at a church in my mid thirties. Okay. I I'd been a, a churchgoer since I was a kid. Our parents took us to church every Sunday, but never attended a church where they ever touched on the early chapters of Genesis, other than to say, yes, God created the world in six days and the seventh day he rested. And now let's move on to Abraham. Right. Um, <laughs> yep. Right. Yeah. Skip over all that stuff. We don't know what to do with. Right. Exactly. Or we're afraid it's to talk. About. It's all weird and we can't document it through science. So we'll just forget all of that stuff. But uh, in my mid thirties, Sharon and I were, uh, you know, after we had married, uh, attended a small independent Baptist church and heard an evangelist talk about it. And I was like, wow, is this always been in here? I mean, this stuff is Sharon's like, yeah. Yeah. Because she was raised in a church that taught end times prophecy from the pulpit on a regular basis. I I never did. So uh, I went to a library in St. Louis County, found L.A. Marzulli's novel called Nephilim. So I blame Marzulli for all of this. (laughs) That kind of led into uh, a a number of lines of research that led to, uh, you know, finding Chuck Missler and his work on aliens and and, uh, stuff. But as we got here and and had time to devote full time to this, um, wrote my first book, The, The Great Inception, which talked about the significance of mountains in the biblical narrative it seems like all of the really significant supernatural events take place on or around mountains you know mount yeah. sinai uh, the mount of olives uh, mount carmel there's mount hermon where the watchers descended and created this uh, giant race of uh, monsters called the nephilim but uh, you know even the mountain that where baal's palace is supposed to be located which is mentioned in isaiah 14 although most english translations don't make it obvious they they translate the name of that mountain as the sides of the north or the heights of the north or the remote slopes of the north um when you start digging into it you realize that mountains were really significant because in the ancient world it was just understood that's where the gods lived because they're remote and pristine and far removed from our grubby human hands and so uh this is where they live well okay you know there's a reason moses was brought up mount sinai and given the law on Uh, what was called the mountain of God in the book of Exodus, but uh, the Hebrew could also read mountain of the gods. Uh, Again, that's another choice that English translators make because there's this default belief against the existence of any other supernatural entity called a small g God other than the God of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And um, as we began pulling on these threads of research, you realize, okay, that's not what God said. God in the Bible calls them gods, and they were really important to the neighbors of the 
Hebrews and the Hebrew prophets knew what their neighbors believed. So maybe there's some, you know, more that we could learn about the ancient world. Maybe some of these yeah. strange, hard to understand parts of the Bible are actually in response to things that their neighbors were doing in the ancient world. And uh, the more we, we dug into the, the, the idea of the Rephaim and learned that the Rephaim, which is just a name given to the spirits of the Nephilim destroyed in the flood, mm -hmm. we discovered, no, we didn't discover, we learned that uh, scholars have known for at least the last 40 or 50 years that the pagans around ancient Israel not only knew who the Rephaim were, they worshipped them. And this is documented in texts that were recovered from a site in northern Syria, an Amorite kingdom called Ugarit. Oh, yeah. It was discovered by a, a, you know, it's always a shepherd stumbling into a cave, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Around in, in, sometime in the 1920s. So for about 100 years, they've had access to these uh, clay tablets that were preserved because the city was destroyed during what uh, what's called the Bronze Age collapse. The end of the Bronze Age ended in fire as most of the Eastern Mediterranean kingdoms from the Hittites down almost to Egypt were just wiped out. Hmm. Um, so these clay tablets were baked and preserved for the last 3,200 years. But it's only been a lot about the last 40 years that scholars have come to agree, yeah, these, uh, these Rephaim were a regular part of the worship of the neighbors of ancient Israel. It was There was a cult of the dead that permeated the culture of the ancient Near East around the Israelites, and the Israelites were drawn into this. And so um, as we dug into that and realized, okay, there's this one character who keeps showing up. If you compare the, the, the cosmologies, the religions of everything from ancient Sumer to Rome, the same pattern repeats over and over again, where there's a sky god who sort of creates everything He's kind of pushed out of the picture by his son, who's uh, usually a grain god of some kind. In some cases, there's a violent confrontation in which the sky god is castrated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then he's in turn replaced by his son, the storm god, who takes over and becomes the king of the pantheon. Mm -hmm. So in ancient, in ancient Sumer, this was Anu, the sky god, replaced by Marduk, the creator god, replaced by the storm god, Marduk. In Canaan, it was... Uh, Shem Shemayim replaced by El replaced by Baal in in uh, you know for the Hittites it was uh, Anu replaced by Kumarbi replaced by Tarhunta and uh, in in Greece it was uh, Uranos replaced by Kronos replaced by Zeus and in Rome it was uh, Calus replaced by uh, Saturn replaced by by Jupiter so same pattern over and over again and uh, again archaeologists and scholars have known this for decades now uh the story of the the hittite and hurrian sky god story you know uh, uh, kumarbi uh they discovered that around world war ii and it's like hey wait a minute oh. didn't make this up the greeks got this from further east and oh wait a minute this this tracks even further east it, it all goes back to an to a same source and we argue that that source the original story is the one that's preserved in the bible so then the question becomes okay who is this dude Saturn, Kronos, El, also known as Enlil, Dagon, Molech, Baal, multiple names. The list goes mm -hmm. on. The list goes on, but fulfilling the same slot in the pantheon for each one of the cultures that worshipped him. Yeah. And uh, how does he, how is he manifested in the Bible? And as I started digging deeper into it, Sharon put me onto some research from a, a site in northern Syria called Tel Mozan, which is the ancient city of Urkesh. Um, founded by the Hurrians around 3500 BC. And that really opened the door to a lot of this because there's some really fascinating leads. But the, the bottom line is this, this entity who the Romans called Saturn, whose best known characteristic was eating his own children. Right. And was the patron somehow of the most popular festival, annual festival in Rome, the Saturnalia, uh, is the character that the Hebrews called Shemiyaza, the leader of the rebellion at Mount Hermon that created these monstrous giant Nephilim. And I argue as the king of the Titans, the king of those who were condemned to the, the netherworld, uh, is the same character who's called the king of the, over those in the abyss in Revelation chapter 9, the destroyer, Apollyon or Abaddon. Yeah. So he's been in the abyss, right? Yeah. Because of the, the angels that the angels that fell, committed that sin. The angels that came down on Mount and Hermon. they're confined to mm -hmm. Tartarus. Right? They're they're in the abyss. They're in Tartarus, yeah. and he right. is the head over them. But he's been locked away mm -hmm. 
how is it that these cults uh, to him have emerged and perpetuated since day one? If he has, if he wasn't active, if he wasn't active oh, yeah. to intervene yeah. for them. Well, that's a really good question. I, I would ask, how is it that a mob boss manages to control action on the streets from while he's in prison? <laughs> Ooh, yeah, good. That's yeah, good. That's a good analogy. Yeah. yeah. I, I wish yeah. I'd thought of that. That's not original to me, but that's, I speculate in the book because that's all we can do. You know, I, I consider the Bible to be the authoritative book yes. on the supernatural realm, or as uh, L.A. Marzulli calls it, the guidebook to the supernatural. Yeah. And we're not told in the Bible what role demons play interacting between these fallen angels and the natural realm. Yeah. Okay, our working theory is is this that uh, demons are the spirits of the Nephilim destroyed in the flood. That was that's explicit in the book of First Enoch, which uh, really gives us detail on what happened in Genesis chapter six, verses one through four. It was the understanding of the early church. When you read the writings of the early church fathers, like Justin Martyr and Irenaeus and uh, uh, others. It's, it's clear that for the first 400 years after the resurrection, they believed that the origin of those demons that Jesus was casting out in the first century were the spirits of the giants destroyed in the flood. Wow. It was after, it was after um, Augustine in the early 5th century, so in the early 400s, where he began uh, writing out and, and codifying a, a theology that was formally adopted by the Roman Catholic Church and sort of became the default setting for christian theology to this day that um th you know all of that stuff in genesis 6 didn't happen the way it says the in the bible view, right. yeah, the satellite view the we don't really know God. why he did yeah. that do we well he came out of a, a cult um and i forget the name of the cult that he came from but it involved the worship of angels and i think he wanted to move christianity uh, away from the idea that yeah. angels were i've heard that a thing yeah and yeah. Uh, yeah. sort of Oddly enough, as we documented in our book, Veneration, Sharon and I found that it was Augustine who's responsible for the veneration of saints in the Roman Catholic and Orthodox churches today. Because mm -hmm. this, cult, this cult of the dead that developed from this worship of these demonic spirits after the flood continued into the Christian era. In fact, wow. uh, we, found, we found that there's research showing that uh, ar archaeologists digging in Rome where you can't plant a garden without hitting archaeology, just like Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. They found that the earliest Christian churches built after Constantine legalized the faith in the year 312 AD were mm -hmm. built in cemeteries so that Christians could continue this practice of holding ritual meals for the spirits of their ancestors. Wow. Because we believe that if you didn't do that, your, your grandparents, great grandparents, your ancestors going back however many generations would uh, cease to exist you had to feed them and give them drink in the afterlife this is documented going back to the middle wow. of the third millennium bc in ancient sumer you know 500 years before abraham there was this monthly ritual being performed by the amorites to summon ancestors <laughs> believe it or not in ancient mesopotamia they were doing the ritual say their names <laughs> <laughs> wow yeah Seriously. i mean uh -huh. the wow. three elements to the ritual say their names feed the statues which are those teraphim that uh jacob's wife rachel stole from his father-in-law yes that's what those mm -hmm. statues were for oh yeah, wow. ritual. yeah. which was held on the night of no moon because you know that's when the veil is thinnest and then they would pour out a libation and that is also part of the modern day ritual uh, say their names then you pour out a drink offering in their honor this was so important wow. in the ancient world that the son the eldest son who was the uh the one who'd inherit the family estate was called the pourer of water because uh, okay. you had to keep the ancestors alive by holding this ritual every month on the 30th of the month, a lunar calendar, the 30th night of no moon. Anyway, fast forward to the first century, second century AD, fourth century AD, Augustine seeing Christians in Rome still doing this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even though for 400 years, the uh, bishops, the teachers, the pastors have been saying, look, we, we don't do this anymore. Yeah. Couldn't stop it. So they said, okay, well, uh, the saints of the ancestors, the saints, or rather the spirits of the saints can't intercede for us in the natural realm. And so they, oh, they wow. continued the practice in the veneration of saints mm -hmm. and it continues to this day among roman catholics and orthodox uh, absolutely it does. you just connected so many dots for me 
right? <laughs> That's yeah. amazing. It yeah. goes amazing. back to Mount Hermon, which is amazing. Yeah, and it really does. And, you know, that's one thing that Nick and I have um, really wrestled with over the past, well, uh, probably 20 years for me, ever since my our dad gave me uh, Clarence Larkin's uh, The Spirit World, mm -hmm. which was like a book written literally almost 100 years ago. Um, and then, but Nick, you've been into this for the past, what, few years at least, yep. ever since you started writing. And mm -hmm. we both have kind of run into this problem where, no one in mainstream thought wants to talk about Genesis six. You know, mm -hmm. it's one of the reasons why we why we gravitate towards men like you and Gary Wayne, um, you know, and these uh, these people who are willing to address this topic. Uh, Rob Skiba, you know, was another one. Mm -hmm. um, Michael Heiser. Michael, Michael Heiser. Heiser. Yeah. Yeah. Michael Heiser. Yeah. 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 Um, so, in fact, um, Will you tell the seed of the serpent oh, story? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So like, Nick has an example of this. Yeah, to Jonathan's think, point. So we started going to a new church about uh, about two months ago, and uh, <clears throat> they have this Wednesday night, uh, kind of a Wednesday night, they call it coffee and theology. So while your kids are off doing youth group, the adults can, it's almost like a Wednesday night service, but it's they're, they're teaching the congregation, you know, solid theology. It's really good. Uh, and while you're, while they're teaching, if you have a question, they actually have a QR code up on up behind them projected up behind them so if you have a question you can ask it anonymously scan the code send your question and at the end of the class they'll go through the questions and they'll answer them for everybody mm -hmm. and they were talking about the nature of sin in this particular one they were talking about you know the fall and man and nature of sin and they were reading from genesis 3 when uh, god uh, is uh, reprimanding adam and then eve and then the serpent you know the proto evangelium and he says to the servant, I'll put enmity between you and the woman. I will put him between your seed and her seed. Uh, you will strike his heel and he will bruise your head and so forth. And um, maybe I've listened to a little much, little too much Chuck Messler, uh, but I wanted to ask. <laughs> uh, That's grandpa that we all wish. We, yeah, you know. <laughs> everyone's everyone's Dude. favorite grandpa. Yeah. Um, but I asked the I typed the question anonymously. Who or what is the seed of the serpent? We know what the seed of the woman is. Of course, obviously, it's Christ ultimately. But it's all we're all the seed of Eve. Yeah. Who's the seed of the serpent? Yeah. I want to know what is that? Yeah. What is what is he talking about? Yeah. And I sent the question in. A very there, relevant question but, to the topic at hand. And I, mean, I thought he was so. Willing to, I thought so. My wife yeah. was with me. And she said, like, all right, fine. I'll see you. Know, go ahead. Go ahead and send it. There were 12 questions total submitted for the class. About 100 people in the class. Only 12 questions got submitted. They answered 11 of them. <laughs> they skipped mine. They ignored it. They didn't address it. They just pretended like it wasn't even submitted. Totally yeah. ignored it. And they were there were questions that were kind of joke questions. Right. Silly you know, questions. Yeah. They All yeah. of those made the list, but they didn't want to touch it. Yeah. And, and it just speaks to this frustrating thing we keep running into where yeah. – you know, there are people who like Christians who have questions about these things. There are non-Christians who have questions. About oh, yeah. Them. They're looking right, for answers. Right. Why won't pastors? Yeah. Give an why why can't this, it's not from you don't hear it in the it's pulpit. stricken from the seminary curriculum. Yeah. You know, I ran into it when I was 17, when I first started writing the Heavenly Realms novels, the pastor's wife of Lighthouse Christian tried to argue with me and say and give the Sethite view. Mm -hmm. You know, so our question, yeah, Derek, is why is this a verboten topic in the church? Well, that, that's a good question. And unfortunately, I can't answer that not being a, a pastor, not having formal seminary training. So I can't really address that. I guess uh, I'm what you call an autodidact, which is just a fancy name for, you know, I, I'm a nerd and I read a lot. Self-taught <laughs> Self nerd. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Join the club, maybe. I, I don't know. I we, We've been friends with a number of pastors, and we, we've talked about some of these issues with them. And we bring up something like, uh, say, transhumanism, which seems to be a pretty relevant topic right about now when you got the World Economic Forum talking about their fourth industrial revolution, and we're going to overcome death with technology. And uh, very well-educated pastors, uh, one of whom was an expert on the, uh, the Apostolic Fathers, you know, a guy, I was like, oh, Irenaeus, who is he? You know, and he would, you know, be able to give really good answers. Had never heard the word transhumanism, much less a definition. So I, I can only guess that it's because this has been avoided in seminaries and because pastors, the ones that we've known, have so many other demands on their time right. that it's not something that most of them will uh, devote a lot of time to just because they, they, 
they can't. They they've got a, a congregation that they're trying to yep. uh, minister to. They've got a family, a wife and children that they're trying to be a responsible husband and father to. Or in the case of uh, the women out there who are pastors, uh, Sharon's niece is uh, a, a really fireball evangelist. So, you know, you've got other demands on your time and here we are, you know, God has just put Sharon and me in a situation and led us down paths of study. Sharon with her background as a, <laughs> she got both halves of her brain going on. I only work with half. <laughs> us too. <laughs> she was a, a gifted vocalist who sang professionally for a couple of decades and then went back to school and got a degree as a molecular biologist. Wow. How, you know, how does that happen? Man. Yeah. So, but all of that is, has led to where we are now, where she can draw on that for the fiction that she writes, for yeah. the presentations yeah. that she gives on topics like transhumanism and end times prophecy. And yeah. uh, me, where I've just been able to indulge this uh, love for reading and learning yeah. in, in, in study here. I, I can only guess it's because it's not been taught. It's not been the default teaching for Christian theologians since the time of Augustine, who was a brilliant man, but wrong about this. Um that uh, most pastors aren't willing to buck what what they've been taught. I mean, this is not what I was taught in seminary, and I've got other things I've got to deal with. Uh, we got a, a Wednesday night sermon to prepare, and then I've got two for Sunday to prepare, and we've got this, that, and yeah, sure. So I, that's that's my guess. That's my yeah. guess. Yeah. Well, and that would make sense too, because I know that Rob Skiba used to talk about like uh, how it's perceived as empty calorie. I think is how he would describe it, you know, and yeah, yeah, I suppose. It, yeah. And you know, that's, uh, it opens up this, this great window of opportunity though, for people such as yourself and Gary Wayne, who, you know, devotes 30 years to writing this tome, you know, of a book and, mm -hmm. uh, and for you and Sharon who write multiple novels and multiple nonfiction, you know, books about this topic, it's a great opportunity but it's just at the same time you try to you try to talk about how a lot of this stuff is the linchpin to understanding so many esoteric things mm -hmm. that are behind the scenes yep. and understanding life, you know, and governments and, and empires. And, and as we watch the world get Burn. increasingly <laughs> weird year over year, yeah. more and more people are going to be they're going to come forward with questions about this. And the church yeah. is not ready. To no, answer those questions. And there are so many, you know, there's so many little tangential things. They seem tangential in the in the Bible that we have, you know, with uh, Jesus taking the sons of thunder up to, you know, Mount yeah. Hermon. And then, you know, all of these little references that are in the New Testament that refer back to this Nephilim story, this story of the watchers and the 200 coming down and no one knows what to do with any of this stuff. Like the thing with demons, you know, no one, yeah. there's such a great misunderstanding about the difference. And this is something that I struggled with when I tried to pitch my books to, you know, Christian publishers and people in the industry. They, they were like, well, what's the difference between demons and fallen angels? And it's like, okay, all right, <laughs> you know, let's, we got to roll this back then, yeah. I guess. And let me get the dry erase board. You know, no one, no one wants to address it. No one thinks that it's necessary or they just they don't know what to do with it. And so it's just if I could just shine a spotlight like a bat signal, you know, yeah, like hand, we'll hand him this book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'll get him yeah. thinking. And you know what? This book is really uh, it's really well written. It's such an easy flowing read. I had a lot of fun it, reading this book. Yeah, uh, yeah the, <clears throat> the the prose itself is um, it lends itself to just like it's a fast read honestly uh, i mean I, I sat down for like one day and, and i'm such a laboriously slow reader uh but i blew through like 50 60 pages just sitting down like for you know and then you wake up oh hey okay i had no idea this is yeah you know yeah my wife yeah. didn't know i had read it it d didn't know it had come in the mail until i was already done with it <laughs> really full of highlighter and <laughs> yeah. everything yeah. and it's a it's a good move on your part too uh, because derek because the material itself it can be kind of heady, you know, and it is so well researched. But when you when you lay it out in such a smooth prose, you know, it's so easily digestible. Let me ask yeah. you a question about your book uh, for the Christian layman yeah. or let's say maybe a patriotic newcomer to this particular channel. And they're watching this. Uh, what is the relevance of the second coming of Saturn? Yeah, it is uh, prophetic. 
And I give credit to Tom Horn for in all of the books that we've written saying, okay, well, this is all really interesting history, but why does it matter to us today? Because unless you can make it relevant to us today, people aren't going to understand why they should read. It won't matter. It's like, okay, curious history. History is boring. I'm not going to read it. Hmm. The reason that the United States Capitol is on the cover of the book mm -hmm. is share again i'll credit where it's due sharon had spotted something during a chapter for for a chapter that she wrote for tom horn's uh, zeitgeist 2025 both of us contributed chapters to the book oh, yeah. and she noted that january 6th the date of the uh you know the so-called insurrection. insurrection yeah of uh, uh, last year yeah. That uh, date happens to fall on uh, th that event happened to fall on a date that's rather significant in the Christian calendar. That's the date called Epiphany or right. Theophany in the Eastern calendar, which is a date of uh, that uh, Christ's divinity was revealed to the three wise men. Okay, that's a traditional thing, but right. it's kind right. of a nudge, nudge, wink, wink in the uh, to the occult realm and the spirit realm. Tom Horn has written a couple of books now about the occult. Sign the significance of the occult symbolism built into the United States Capitol, and in a broader sense, Washington, D.C. as a whole. Uh, the documentary Belly of the Beast, the books, uh, uh, oh, Apollyon Rising 2012, uh, Zenith 2016, even Zeitgeist 2025 kind of goes back and, and touches on the same themes. Um, but where I, I think Tom is correct in, in seeing in the United States Capitol symbolism that points to a... Uh, a, a secret society or a cult desire to bring back this entity called Apollyon. Uh, but Tom identifies Apollyon as the Antichrist, whereas I think it's this entity, the Romans called Saturn. And I, I see significance and symbolism in the apotheosis of Washington that suggests that he was depicted in, in that painting, not just as a, uh, rising to take his place among the assembly of the gods in the heavens, but uh, specifically as Saturn, or as this old god who is coming to, uh, he believes, reclaim his rightful place as the ruler of creation. Um, and when you connect that to the, the uh, chapters in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, which I argue were not directed at Satan, but at this entity, Apollyon or Abaddon in the uh, in the Hebrew. Uh, th this entity, I think, is separate and distinct from Satan. Led the rebellion in Genesis six, which is separate from the Genesis three rebellion of the uh, the serpent in the garden. That being Satan, um, I, I think there are groups, occult groups out there, occult adepts who are actively working towards bringing this entity back to earth. Now, the Bible tells us he will come back, Revelation chapter 9, but when he comes back, he only gets five months, which bookends the 150 days that Noah's ark was on the water. Genesis 7 and 8, we're told that the ark was on the water for 150 days, which in a lunar yeah. calendar is exactly five months before it came to land in the mountains of Ararat, which I think is more evidence that we're looking at this same creature, this uh, entity who led the rebellion that prompted God to send the flood of Noah, gets out at the end and gets five months to torment those without the seal of God in their foreheads. So um, that's the significance for Christians today. The encouraging thing, though, is that, uh, first of all, setting aside the argument over when, uh, if there's a rapture, and if so, when does it happen, which is a sure way to divide uh, any Christian <laughs> into yeah. what pre mid post pre wrath what whatever oh, no. whatever it doesn't, doesn't <laughs> whatever because either way any way you slice it if you're a believer in Jesus Christ you've got the seal of God on your foreheads and this this creature can't touch you yeah now, I think Sharon and I both believe that uh, the the pre tribulation rapture is correct the evidence points to that so we won't be here when this creature gets out of the abyss but even if we are we're protected so yeah. uh, that's the encouraging thing for believers the good news is you don't have anything to fear from this entity but let's understand why certain things are happening in the world around us that otherwise make no sense if you don't view the world through a supernatural lens through a biblical lens mm -hmm. things happening in the world like the like the massacre in Uvalde this past week yeah. mm -hmm. make no sense. The Christian mm -hmm. worldview and the existence of intelligent evil 
yeah. helps yeah. understand why bad things happen to good people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Beyond just the rains fall on the just and the unjust alike. You know, you it does help you understand that there is there there are dark forces behind the scenes that are manipulating and you know creating machinations that do manifest and all of these little these little baphomet cults and these mm. luciferian ideologies right. well kind of kind of tied to that too a couple of weeks ago they had that big senate hearing on ufos oh right yeah. you know how, how how would you i mean knowing this how would you use this as a way to uh, interpret what's going on in light of this recent phenomenon well sharon and i uh included a section in our book veneration about that um and actually it was drawn from research that uh, i did for the book josh peck and i wrote back in 2017 which came out the week before the new york times broke that story of the uh, tic tac from uh, the oh, 2004 yeah. nimitz incident in fact we were just uh -huh. watching a documentary on that this afternoon oh cool um, yeah, the, the book Josh and I wrote called uh, The Day the Earth Stands Still, which is a play on that old 1952 movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, the, the remake with Keanu Reeves, haven't watched it, don't care to. But, uh, you know, Klaatu, Barada, Nikto, uh, was, that's classic. Mm -hmm. This is a spiritual, it is a supernatural phenomenon. It is not a, a technological phenomenon. Uh, there is no yes. evidence... I mean, there's plenty of evidence that Earth has been visited by inhuman entities for literally millennia, but there's no evidence, no credible evidence that these entities are coming from outside of our solar system. Yes. They've been with us the whole time. Even some of the secular researchers like uh, Jacques Vallée, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. John Mack, acknowledge that some of the uh, things reported by experiencers and um, contactees is mm -hmm. more of a supernatural phenomenon than uh, than anything else that uh, these things only appear to be violating the laws of physics because they're moving into and out of our perceivable dimensions so we're limited to perceiving three spatial dimensions and then time whereas you know advanced mathematics has shown that there are as many as 11 dimensions or some mm -hmm. actually uh, uh chuck missler talked about this uh that the medieval yeah. um uh, rabbi Maimonides just looking at the book of Genesis concluded there were 11 dimensions originally. Isn't that incredible? Jeez. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? What, what a mind to be able to do that and to be able to do it without Google, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Books. Yeah. So, With what, an Abacus what, and some papyrus. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So Adam and Eve, when they were kicked out of the garden, uh, just were suddenly now limited to not being able to perceive it in that dimension and i think there's some evidence out there that that is that that we may be able to open ourselves to those dimensions through things like mindfulness or dmt you know ayahuasca uh, right the, uh, spirit molecule experiments of dr rick strassman years ago yep but we're not supposed to which is why god told moses don't consult with necromancers don't consult with mediums yeah. don't isn't it interesting when you're talking about the uh, the alien contacting phenomenon that all of this contact is coming through telepathy mm -hmm. i mean we're supposed to yeah. believe that these entities somehow solved the the engineering challenges of moving an object from one solar system to another yeah you know dealing with the amount of energy required to move something that distance dealing with the radiation you would uh, be exposed to over uh, uh -huh. you know through interstellar space and yet somehow when they got here they don't know how to use a webcam right yeah yeah Come and on. this is yeah and this is something that yeah. derek has definitely thought about as a hard science fiction aficionado and yeah. you know as a um correct me if i'm wrong you've written science fiction novels as well is that right i know you've written fantasy yeah oh there was one and i've never been a big fan of fantasy so iron dragons right. uh, i find a way to to explain the dragons as uh in a science fiction context it's pretty cool so, yeah. yeah that's yeah. awesome yeah, that was my first attempt at a novel was a science fiction one because I was such a huge Babylon 5 fan. And then I you quickly, were. quickly... You were a huge Babylon 5 fan. <laughs> Babylon 5 and Gettysburg. I quickly realized uh i am not smart enough to matt to get this down so we're just we're just gonna do angels and medieval work <laughs> there you go you know? <laughs> well so eric i have a question for you uh this is a this is uh, a little bit of a turn away from what we've been discussing so far uh but you have uh proposed that and you've taken this question before so i know you're ready for it uh satan and lucifer oh yeah 
may not be the same thing. Yeah, it may right. not be the same entity. Can you expand on that a little bit and tell people yeah. how you came to that conclusion? Well, it was really um, reading carefully Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. And when you start digging into Isaiah 14, and you realize that, uh, you know, and, and scholars will agree, I mean, Bible students will agree that uh, those two chapters are parallel chapters. They, they refer to the same rebellion. But nothing in Isaiah 14, which is the famous, How art thou fallen, O Lucifer, son of the morning? It doesn't ever in that chapter or in Ezekiel 28 specifically make mention of what happened in Genesis chapter 3, the temptation of Adam and Eve. So there's nothing there that specifically can, we just have always assumed right. that that must be the, referring to that incident because that's the only rebellion in the garden, right? And Lucifer is referred to as walking amongst the fiery stones, so we sort of equate him with being in the garden, and it just the two become conflated to the point it's where circular it's logic. simple. Right. right. It's circular logic when you, you assume that there's only one rebellion, so it must refer to, but you know, and I, it took me probably 15 years to come around to this because a friend of ours named David W. Lowe wrote a book years back, 15 years ago, called Deconstructing Lucifer, where he made that argument that, uh, and he actually went in and showed that it was a process of a couple of centuries after the resurrection. Mm -hmm. The early church did not consider Lucifer and Satan. They didn't see Satan in either Isaiah 14 or Ezekiel 28. It was it was a process of a couple of centuries. Interesting. Where, uh, yeah, and until about the uh, you know, the time of Origen and uh, Jerome, who okay. translated the the Vulgate uh, Bible, which is where we get the Lucifer. It's uh, Latin lux and uh, ferus, meaning light bringer, uh, which okay. is a translation of the the Hebrew Helel ben Shakar, uh, light bringer, son of dawn. Mm -hmm. It uh, again, there, there's nothing in there hmm. that specifically connects Satan. Assuming again, and I'm willing to accept this, that uh, he is the serpent, the Nakash in Genesis chapter three. There's nothing that connects as Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 to Genesis three, other than the assumption that this must be the rebellion that's being discussed here, because we don't know of any others, except yeah. that we yeah. carefully at Jude verses six uh -huh. and seven and Second Peter two. Verse 4, when uh, Peter, for example, refers to God not sparing the angels when they sinned. Wait a minute, angels, plural. Mm -hmm. So there's more than one here. Who who uh -huh. are these others? And when you read Jude and Peter in context, you you see that we're, they were specifically referring to a sexual sin. Now, there's nothing in the Old Testament that connects Satan to any kind of a sexual sin other than those who try to read into Genesis chapter 3 and saying, ah, yes, the oh, serpent's wow. seed is Satan and Eve. No, no, no. Adam knew his wife, and she oh, conceived and bore a son. Genesis 3 verse 1 specifically says Adam was the father of Cain. Yeah. Put that one to rest. Anyway, um... The, yeah. the Jews in the Old Testament, when you look at the other mentions of Satan in the Old Testament, there is nothing there that connects Satan to the underworld or to the Nephilim or the Rephaim, the later form of the Nephilim, mm -hmm. anywhere. Satan, it, it, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, both make it clear that this rebel is kicked out of Eden and cast down to the netherworld, to Sheol. The shades in Isaiah 14, which is the Rephaim in the Hebrew, rise mm -hmm. up and greet him when he falls. Um, Ezekiel... 28, when you read Ezekiel in context, Ezekiel's got a lot to say about the netherworld. You get into Ezekiel 31 and 32, and uh, you read about the chiefs of the Gibberim, the chiefs, uh, the mighty chiefs who are in the midst of Sheol. And yeah. then you compare that with the Septuagint translation, you see that it's clear they're talking about the giants of old mm -hmm. who passed down to Sheol. Uh, there's the the context for what you're seeing in Ezekiel 28 with this entity you cast out of Eden down to the netherworld. But Satan still has access to the throne room. I mean, Job, you know, hey, where have you been walking to and fro in the earth? Hey, check out this friend, this this guy, Job. Look, or, look how righteous he is. Mm -hmm. You also see in Zechariah where mm -hmm. Satan appears and challenges or uh, accuses the high priest named Joshua in the days of Zerubbabel. So he still got access to the throne room of God. The Jews in the time of the apostles 
never considered Satan as an underworld figure connected to the dead. There's nothing in the Old Testament that gives us that interesting. Uh, yeah. That, that 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 connection. This was something that developed in the centuries after the resurrection in the early Christian church. Now, it's not to say that this character that we come to know as Lucifer is a good guy. Right. He's right. not. I mean, I, the whole point of writing my book is arguing, say, hey, hey, we've missed one here. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> even worse than Satan, if that's even possible. Mm. Uh -huh. Because when you read Ezekiel 28 and you see, you know, every precious stone was your covering. Yeah. And when you read that and you read and again, compare it to the Septuagint, the Septuagint, which is the older translation from Hebrew into Greek, about 200 B.C., so 200 years before Christ was born, the uh, Jewish scholars in Alexandria translated texts we don't have access to anymore. Oh, and yeah. they've got 12 stones that matches the 12 stones of the ephod, the high priest. Mm -hmm. yep, yep. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, so this entity in Ezekiel, this entity in Isaiah 14 might have been the high priest in Eden? Yeah. yeah. And then he rebelled and was cast out. Like, yeah. oh, that's that's really interesting. But the, the final piece of evidence um, was when our friend Dr. Doug Hamp, who's uh, written three books under the name Corrupting the Image, Volumes 1, 2, and 3. And in Volume 2, he talked about the, the Mount Hermon inscription, wrote about that. Um, he drew some new information from that stone, the first new information from the inscription in a hundred years, which is really fascinating. But he pointed me to a, a paper by Dr. William Gallagher, written about uh, almost 30 years ago now, where he showed how Helel ben Shakar is what you get when you transliterate from the original Akkadian into West Semitic, like Ugaritic, and, oh, yeah. then, and then into Hebrew, the name Enlil. Like, oh, uh, Okay, because Enlil, again, is this Canaanite creator god El, who was later known to the Greeks as Kronos and to the Romans mm -hmm. as Saturn. Mm -hmm. So there's mm -hmm. a connection, and it's connected to Doug's research and his new translation of the Mount Hermon inscription, which was found on the summit of Mount Hermon by uh, Sir Charles Warren in 1869. Mm -hmm. Which uh, So you've got this connection now, mm -hmm. this chief god, this creator god of the Greeks, Romans, Canaanites, Amorites, Akkadians, Babylonians, Hurrians, Hittites, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the summit of Mount Hermon. Yeah. yeah. And I think he's the one who is being referred to in Isaiah uh, 14 and Ezekiel 28. It's not Satan. It's Saturn. Shemiyaza, the Shemiyaza. leader of the rebellion who created the giants, okay. the Nephilim, the cult of the dead, demons that afflict us to this day, and mm -hmm. the one who is called the destroyer, Abaddon or Apollyon. Wow. And that's the that's the interesting thing about these two, you know, these two conflicting antagonists. They're they're almost it's possible that they're and this was one of our other questions, you know, are they antagonists against each other? We know they're in a way antagonists towards us in that Satan, whatever his role is, is the accuser. Right. You know, and then Lucifer, uh, Abaddon. Polyon, Shimiaza, the leader of the Watchers, there's a more tangible, practical threat, a persistent, you know, tactile threat almost in mm -hmm. some ways, you know, that's just with all of the, the Nephilim and then the Nephilim empires and then the royal bloodlines and just this cult, you know, mm -hmm. the Saturnalia cult, the cube of Saturn, you know, it's just, it's so persistent, you know, it mm -hmm. permeates through everything. And yet, ironically, he's locked away in the abyss mm -hmm. and yet you know his empire continues you know to and then you have like the weird overlaps with um you know lucifer Lightbringer, prometheus mm -hmm. the yes. punishment of prometheus you know uh, so they're and you know and, and zeus and washington and you know no one worships chronos but everyone worships zeus you know, even yeah. though, you know, and no one worships the predecessor to Kronos, you know, except for probably some weird fringe mystery cult, you know, that probably. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's the thing is that, uh, again, Sharon pointed me to this this ancient Hurrian site city called uh, Urkesh, where yeah. this husband and wife archaeology uh, archaeologist from UCLA, the Buchilates, uh, been working there since the 1990s. But sadly, frustratingly, can't get into the, the, the country now because of that Sir, right. Sir, Syrian civil war since 2011. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, that that area is uh, 
just read this morning, the Turkish government's getting uh, the rumors wanting to set up a 30 kilometer security zone inside Syria. So they're they may be, uh, you know, invading that, that very area here wow. in the next uh, week or two. But uh, it's not that far from um, Gobekli Tepe, you know, oh, so maybe really? miles. Yeah, it's really not that far from that area if you want to go back another 8,000 years. Ah. But about 3,500 BC, this city was developing in what was northern Mesopotamia at the time. Now, scholars have assumed since the discoveries in Sumer, southeast Iraq, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, that civilization began there at cities like Ur and. Mm -hmm. uh, and Nippur and Eridu and moved northward from there. But that's been changing the last 20 years as they found sites in the north, like Tel Mozan and uh, uh, others that were just as developed at the same period of history as the mm -hmm. ancient uh, as the ancient Sumerian cities. So this site developed by the Hurrians, and they were able to identify this because of some very unique, well, a couple of things. First of all, the fact that the Hurrian religious texts were preserved by the uh, the Hittites in what is now central Turkey for like 2,000 years. Okay, so around the time of the judges, uh, when the Hittite kingdom fell, they had preserved ancient religious texts from the Hurrians that were yeah, 2,000 yeah. years old then. Mm -hmm. Okay, and one of the key elements of worship was this ritual pit at the site Oh, yes. That uh, goes down about 40 feet called uh, the Abi, the A-B-I. Mm -hmm. And according to the uh, yeah. Yeah. texts, the, uh, the the purpose of this was to go down into this pit and draw a magic circle on the floor and so maybe mark it out with uh, flour or salt or something. That sounds uh -huh. familiar to certain practices today. Uh -huh. And sacrifice a small animal, a piglet or a, a, a lamb or a puppy they would even use and then summon these entities from the netherworld yeah and then ask them for favors and then when they were done they would cover up the hole and would put a, a reed lid on top of it i guess a, a lid <laughs> a covering made of reeds was strong enough to keep these spirits in the in in, in the netherworld but this goes back to like 3500 bc they estimate based on the depth of the hole and the age of the broken pottery and things that they found in the hole as far down as they were able to get. But the pottery that they found at this site, this is really fascinating, is is tied to a culture, an older culture, that uh, archaeologists call the Kura Araxis civilization, which are named for the two rivers on either side of the, uh, the Caucasus Mountains in Armenia and Turkey. In other words, this civilization migrated there around 4500 BC. They spread out it's going southeast to Iran, southwest down as far as the Sea of Galilee in uh, Israel, and then into what is now northern Syria and northern Iraq. Um, but that area in, uh, in between the Caucasus Mountains is uh, is the plains of Ararat. In other words, the area yeah. below the mountains where Noah's Ark came to rest. Right. So yeah. after the flood, some of the descendants of Noah said, hey, we need to get back in touch with those old gods who uh, are down mm -hmm. in the netherworld now. Yeah, because they were the ancient powers that were digging, wiped out by the yes, flood. Mm -hmm. them. Yeah, yeah. Well, the uh, in in the book I show some of the research that uh, scholars have pieced together, and I'm making a short story long. But the bottom line is this word "abi" is the origin of the Hebrew word "ov," which is translated "medium" in the Bible. So when Saul, King Saul, the night before he died, went to consult the medium of Endor, he oh, was yeah. consulting the ov of Endor. Mm. And that story where she summoned a spirit, the spirit of the prophet Samuel came up from the earth because she was using a ritual pit, just like they've been using, the Hurrians had been using for 2,000 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it all connects together and we can draw it a, a straight line back to the Ararat Plain yeah. below where the Ark came to rest. Judd Burton, Judd Burton wrote a paper last summer uh, in which he traced the phoneme, which is a little piece of language, behind the words in most of the modern Eurasian languages for ruler or king or royalty, and uh, traced it back to the area between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. Well, that's that area between the Caucasus Mountains, the Greater and Lesser Caucasus, the Ararat Plain. That, yeah. that phoneme includes the Hebrew word Rephaim. 
So, wow. Yeah. yeah and we were working on this independently. It's like, okay, final edit. The book wasn't done yet, which is why, if you've seen in the book, I cite Judd's research in there. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, to me, this is just more confirmation. We can trace all of this back to these watchers led by this character, Shemiyaza, who the Romans yeah. called Saturn. Yeah. Man. Do you have a question? Uh, well, yeah. Because I know, have a follow up too. Do you? Yeah. Go ahead, because mine always like a dovetail. Though. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, forever. So, so Shemyaza, uh, the, the the leader of the Watchers. These are the angels that came down. They, through their sin with human women, created the Nephilim. Yeah. Right. The Nephilim were wiped up by the flood, and then we get the Rephaim, the spirits, the demon. What what many believe are the demon spirits that are roaming in, during the time of Christ all the way yeah. up to today. The parentage of which is in the abyss. Yeah. We also, at the same time, have Satan, mm -hmm. who is working against those who follow the Lord, working against the accuser Christians. He's the the accuser of the brethren. Yeah. And you know, we've always assumed that the demons are the fallen angels that serve Satan. I don't believe that anymore. I believe, yeah. but but at the same time, I'm trying to figure out what is the relationship now if the if demons are the offspring if they're the nephilim spirits the offspring of shemyaza who's locked away yeah what is the relationship between them and satan does he coerce them does he co work with them, them? does he are bully they... them like right what what do you suspect are they competitors you know that, that's a really good question i i talked with la marzulli about this uh some months ago and, and said okay let, let's throw out a hypothetical here what what scenario do you see like, okay satan had his rebellion where he got adam and eve kicked out of the garden and now they're going to suffer death which they would not have suffered before because they disobeyed God. Mm -hmm. Why then would this other rebellion take place? Was this other guy? I mean, I, I my assumption is that the fallen realm are like uh, Democrats, and I'm just using Democrats for an example. There's no connect, you know, any re resemblance between Democrats and fallen angels or demons sure. is sure, uh, you know, coincidental. <laughs> but just like in the 2020 election. Um, Keep they going. all were united in their opposition to Donald Trump. They were all fighting uh -huh. with one another over who got to sit in the chair next. Yep. So I think that's what we're looking at with the fallen realm. And L.A. said, you know, maybe the whole point of creating the Nephilim was to create an army that would supplant humanity, that we were created to take dominion of the earth. Right. So that a human would... You, you would need to be fully human in order to become king of the world, as it were. Um, the Nephilim were an attempt to replace humanity by two ways, perhaps. One, by just wiping out the human race, which God didn't allow. Or secondly, by creating a hybrid who would just rule over the human race. And again, God didn't allow that. He put a stop to that. But according to First Enoch, and again, the understanding of the early church was that these spirits of the giants destroyed in the flood were condemned to the wander of the earth, tormenting humanity until the final judgment. Yeah. Yeah. Well, after the flood, we see in Deuteronomy 32, verse nine, verse eight and nine, when God divided the nations, he numbered them according to the son, the number of the sons of God. Uh, the older translations will say the number of the sons of Israel. That's based on the Masoretic text. But the Septuagint, which again is the older text translated mm -hmm. by Jewish religious scholars 200 years before the birth of Jesus from older Hebrew texts, they understood that these were spirit beings, not the sons of Israel in Deuteronomy. In other words, when God divided the nations, he placed the nations under the authority or at least the supervision of these other sons of god so other angels other angelic beings were sort of delegated the task of supervising humanity and we can see that they chose to uh, exercise their authority badly psalm 82 is like a courtroom scene where god takes his place in the midst of the divine council in the midst of the gods he renders judgment how long will you rule unjustly though you are gods all of you sons of the most high like men you shall die and fall like any prince um so they're under a death sentence. This would include, I think, Satan, who Jesus in Matthew 12, verses 22 through 26, identified as Baal. This was the scene oh, where uh, right. Jesus is accused of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul, Baal the prince. 
And Jesus says, if Satan cast out demons by his own power, how will his kingdom stand? Which is interesting, because now we've learned something else interesting, that by the time of the New Testament, Satan is no longer just wandering the earth. He's got a kingdom. Yep. Right. The yep. prince yep. of this world, yeah, the yeah. god of this world. Yeah. So that's interesting. Uh, we also see this connection in... Uh, Revelation 2, the letter that Jesus dictates to John for the church at Pergamum. I know where you live, where Satan dwells. That's a reference yeah. to the Greek form of the storm god, Baal, Zeus. It says Satan is Zeus, Satan is Baal, Satan is the storm god. So he's got a kingdom now on this earth, whereas this other dude, who's now in the abyss, who was perhaps the high priest in, in, in Eden prior to his fall, Mm -hmm. is waiting for his chance to come out and plotting along with his children oh, yeah. his minions and looking for his return so what, what is the, the connection door. yeah what is the connection in the end times sharon and i've dealt with that uh in fact we've got a program coming up on uh, unraveling revelation i think next week we release it on um we titled the program hell on earth because you know what, what's the connection satan is clearly in the book of revelation the leader of the end times rebellion mm -hmm. this character called the destroyer gets out but he only gets five months. Then there's the, the woman in Scarlet, the woman who rides the beast, the Antichrist. Sharon has convinced me that this is the entity called Inanna by the Sumerians or Ishtar by the Akkadians and Babylonians. Oh, yeah. Aphrodite to the Greeks, um, mm -hmm. the Roman. Uh, Queen Whatever. of Heaven, she is called. The Queen of Heaven. Heaven. Yes. Um, mm. She was the ori original gender fluid entity on planet Earth. There are Sumerian mm -hmm. hymns praising her for being able to change women to men and men to women. And anyway, that's the age we live in. Wow. Right. When you read when you read the, the myths and the stories about uh, Inanna in ancient Sumer and how she was uh, called the Queen of Heaven then. And then after the death of the Bull of Heaven, part of the Gilgamesh epic, uh, the Bull of Heaven was the consort of her sister, who was queen of the underworld. So she goes down to the underworld to visit her sister, Eresh Kigal. And uh, it's clear from the uh, story that Ereshkigal realizes what Inanna is trying to do. She wants to become the queen of the netherworld as well as the queen of heaven. And she'd already tricked her uncle, Enki, who was the clever god, who was the god of the Abzu, the abyss, uh, into giving up the mez, which were the, uh, the rules or the principles that guided human civilization. So she controlled the mez, which was what governed human life on earth. She was the queen of heaven, trying to become the queen of the netherworld. And in Revelation, she's the one who's riding the Antichrist, riding the beast. Oh, wow. She thinks yeah. that she's going to rule. So you've got these competing interests, I think, in the end times. You've got Satan, who's supposedly leading this. The Antichrist, who we argue, is Leviathan, chaos. Mm -hmm. You've got mm. Destroyer, who comes out in Revelation 9 with his minions, the Titans, yeah. And then you got the woman in Scarlet who thinks she's going to rule until the beast turns on her and destroys her. So, yeah, I think what you're seeing is like a political party where they all want to unseat Yahweh, the God of the Bible, but mm -hmm. they all fight with each other as to who's going to rule in his place. Yeah. Pelosi, AOC, <laughs> Clintons, oh, Hillary, yeah, who's gonna, oh, who's gonna, oh, Hill Dog, yeah. you know. I'll leave it up to you to figure what out which one of those is the beast and which is the harlot. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, the, it's it's always so interesting reading uh, reading this stuff through a a biblical lens, a, a Christian esoteric lens, because you you see the parallels and the overlap, the Venn diagram between all the different religions, and how it's kind of they're all just telling the same um same story the same depressing story because yeah. it's like you look at you look at zeus you know what is one of the things that zeus is always in trouble for <laughs> is coming down to earth and sometimes he's a bull and sometimes he's a swan right, right. and you know sometimes and then, he's an eagle yeah sometimes he's an eagle where the eagles are gathered you know and yeah. and he's always finding some chick and maybe every now and then some dude well, and yeah. you know it's always getting him in trouble and it's just you know it's it's the story it's the it's the mount herman story over and over again that's that's yeah. very true and that, in fact that was one bit of uh symbolism that sharon picked up on that's uh in the book the uh the apotheosis of washington depicts young america as uh 
a young man wearing a Phrygian cap, which is kind of that floppy pointed headed cap that you yeah. see. Uh, it's also called a Liberty cap, but um, uh-huh. Ganymede the Libertine cap. Yeah, I think that's a better way of describing it. Um, Ganymede was. Oh, yeah, was that was a, uh, a shepherd, but he was like the son of the king of, of Troy. Mm hmm. And uh, Zeus saw that this young man was fair. He was he was comely to look mm-hmm. at, uh, and uh, so Zeus swept down as an eagle and uh, carried him off to uh, to Olympus. And most of the stories that kids read, it's cleaned up. So they carried him up to Olympus right. to become cupbearer of the gods. Well, yeah, uh-huh. look at some of the paintings of this. It's pretty clear the eagle is is really enjoying himself a lot more than Ganymede yeah. was. But yeah, uh, it's not this kind of cup that they're talking about. It's, no. it's a different cup bearer. You know? but here's the thing. If you, if you compare this going back to what I mentioned earlier about that monthly ritual where you were feeding the dead, feeding the ancestors. And a key mm-hmm. part of that ritual was pouring water. Yeah. OK, so you've got the water bearer, the, the, the cup pourer, the cup bearer on Mount Olympus. And um, when when all of this was done, when. Uh, Ganymede died. Zeus immortalized him by putting him in the stars as Aquarius. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it was, we yeah, and, and getting back to the U.S. Capitol on the uh, on the cover there, it was uh, the great conjunction of mm-hmm. the twenty first of twenty twenty, the winter solstice, where yeah. Jupiter and Saturn met at zero degrees of Aquarius in the night sky. And uh, you know, we we understand as Christians that the movement of the planets in the heavens have no impact whatsoever, no influence over our destinies, our fortunes, or anything like that. Right. But, in fact, God specifically warned against doing that sort of divination or fortune. Divination, yeah. But this, th- there are some very prominent, very powerful people who do believe that this is a thing. I mean, you know, Nancy Reagan used to set Ronald's calendar yeah. on the advice of her uh, astrologer. So there are some very powerful people who believe that that signified the winter solstice of 2020 signified the official final entry of the world into the age of Aquarius, which is a constellation under the uh, old style of astrology ruled by Saturn. So yeah. going back to an old way of doing things, in other words, we're, re- we've returned to the golden age where Saturn reigns. And this is, uh, this is why that poem uh, by Virgil, the fourth eclogue, is mentioned in the, uh, in the book. Tom Horn, again, has written about this a number of times in his books. Uh, it's, it's a belief that uh, the world is on the verge of a new golden age, um, you know, returns old Saturn's reign with a new breed of men sent down from heaven. Yeah, no, we saw that story before. That's mm. Genesis 6. But yeah. this is what Virgil, the Roman poet Virgil, wrote about um, 40 wow. years before the birth of Jesus. And again, there are occult adepts who are th- who think that this is a good thing and we should be working toward that. And uh, so all of this, you know, again, just two weeks after that, that great conjunction, we had the uh, incident at the United States Capitol with all of the symbolism uh, built mm-hmm. into that. Chaos day. magic. You had mentioned something about the guy with the buffalo uh, yeah, horns. Yeah. Uh, in another interview, forgive me for not remembering which one, um, uh, practicing chaos magic at the time. Sharon, yeah, Sharon talked about this, and this was in her chapter for Zeitgeist 2025, which I uh, she, she graciously allowed me to uh, steal for. Uh, the you guys Zeitgeist. are a match made in heaven, you know. Five yeah. miles more, and you never would have met each other. You know? uh, yes, yes. <laughs> That's so that, awesome. uh, yeah, God's God's <laughs> handiwork there. No kidding. But she pointed out that this fella uh, because. And, and we spotted this going back to my book, Last Clash of the Titans, that yeah, yeah. buffalo imagery or bison imagery is all over the ancient world. That uh, in ancient Sumer, you could tell who the gods were in their art by looking for the, the helmet with the multiple sets of horns. The horns of power. It's even right. in the 13th warrior, the mm-hmm. leader of the bad guys, the Vendol, yep. he wears the yep. horns of power. That's yeah, even, it's yep. all over a cult. Yeah, yeah. Propaganda. So it's, uh, a, a, in fact, one of the things that w- was startling was, was finding, you know, a, a, the, the scholarly research that, that confirms this, a, a fellow whose work, I've, I've read just about everything he's written, uh, Dr. Nicholas Wyatt, or I, I shouldn't say everything, but a lot of what he's written, uh, he specializes in these Ugaritic texts and how it uh, overlaps with the Bible. And he pointed out that the, uh, the name of the king of the Titans in Greek, uh, Kronos, derives from a Semitic word that means horns. So he is literally the horned one. Wow, um, yeah. And Kernunos, who is the horned god of the uh, the Celts, uh, a, a variant of, of that. 
but uh, even the name of the Titans derives from an ancient Amorite word taken from the uh, the Akkadian name for the aurochs, the bison, the buffalo, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, they were the bulls, basically. Yeah. And this is what we're looking at on January 6th last year, Epiphany, yeah. you know, the day when Christ's divinity is revealed to the three wise men. This guy wearing the bison hat, the buffalo hat, leads the group into America's temple, as it was called by many of our political leaders, uh, Schumer, yeah. Pelosi, many others, uh, <laughs> and it's a conception ritual because the capital is supposed to be sort of like, if I remember correctly, the capital is the womb and the Washington Monument, the right. obelisk is the phallic symbol and right. the, the pool between them. Yeah. So mm. it's such a it's such a desecration. Yeah. yeah. And you're looking at something that's so ancient and it seems so random. That was, you know, I mean, you want to talk about like kind of playing your hand a little bit. You know, they they mocked this guy. They talked about this guy. There was all this talk about whether this dude was QAnon or whether he was, you know, uh, deep state or whatever. Mm -hmm. But there was that whole, you know, Hegelian dialectic dual narrative. But he's still wearing this weird buffalo head headdress. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and here we are. It's, it's and I think as Christians, we have to understand, as Paul wrote, that we're not wrestling against human opponents, but against principalities and powers and cosmic mm -hmm. rulers over this present darkness. Mm -hmm. That a lot of these things, I think, are done by people who don't know what they're doing. I mean, even Christ on the cross, yeah. if God would forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. True. I think. I mean, did, did Constantino Bramiti, who painted the Apotheosis of Washington, consciously? Yeah, yeah put the purple cloth around Washington's legs in the same way that uh, the statue of Saturn in his temple in ancient Rome had its legs wrapped, except yeah, during the Saturnalia, which symbolized him getting out of uh, Tartarus. Probably not. Did, did he know that he was depicting young America like Ganymede, who was the boy toy of mm -hmm. Satan, Zeus? <laughs> probably not. But somewhere yeah. in the spirit realm, you probably got these demons who are getting like bonuses for whispering into the ears of these guys and getting this stuff done. The Jacob Chansley, you know, Jacob Angel, he, he, his stage name, Jacob Angely. Mm -hmm. okay. Angel, he, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. Did he really understand what he was doing? Right. I don't think he did. He, based on the interviews and things I've read about him and seen about him, he, he seems like kind of a confused young man who's looking for attention, but. Uh, mm -hmm like that can be manipulated well that's a big thing and you know because you were you were in secular radio for a little while that's a big thing with the um with the hip-hop community and with the rap and and mainstream you know rap culture and there's all this you know there's all this illuminati imagery that right, they're right. you know that they're doing mm -hmm. and participating yep. in and uh, all and it's masonic and it you know it's it's a cult mystery cult you know stuff and uh same thing how many of these people know what they're doing are they conscious of what of what the symbols mean or are and are they doing it even if they are are they doing it just like you say not because the stars have any real power over humanity but because they think it does so they're mm -hmm. practicing these rituals trying to curry favor and it creates this whole like false empire mm -hmm. this you know yeah, I think that's it. Uh, Sharon and I are working on a book now called uh, The Gates of Hell. And really? it's it's started that's out fun. originally as, yeah, a, a little light reading, you know. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> it started out as uh, a, a look at the geography of the Levant, which is, you know, Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, Western really? Syria. Um, cool. And where some of the more supernatural things took place. I, I did a presentation a, a couple of years ago on um, the uh, the Jordan Rift, which is uh, a fault line that runs, you know, the Jordan River basically is on top of a rift between two two uh, uh, plates. And uh, it's they're moving at different speeds, which is why you've got the Jordan River, the Dead Sea, the Sea of Galilee, uh, Lake Hula, which is mostly drained. But there, uh, the, the Bekaa Valley between the Lebanon and anti-Lebanon mountains, it, it's all a rift uh, that goes down all the way into um, in, into into uh, Africa and extends up north into Turkey. So a lot of um, geologic uh, seismic activity along mm -hmm. that that line over the years. They're they're really overdue for a massive earthquake. Um, they've had a number of them, oddly enough, during the uh, 11th century during the Crusades. Almost like there were you know forces fighting in the in the earth. I mean, really massive earthquakes were felt as far away as Sicily and stuff. But when you look at um, where a lot of the supernatural things 
the supernatural events in the Bible, most of them occurred within, say, 25, 30 miles either side of that line, with the exception of like the Tower of Babel and uh, uh, maybe the parting of the Red Sea. But uh, depending on where that took place, if it was the Red Sea, well, the Red Sea is right on that rift as well. But as we began to do more research on it, we thought, okay, no, that's that's almost like we're giving credence to the idea that there are certain places on the planet where there are portals and that portals can be opened through magical mm -hmm. workings. And yeah. Mike Heiser said something really wise once. We, we cite Heiser at least once in every interview just uh, yeah. because <laughs> his work is so foundational and because he's really insightful when it comes to this. He said, look, most of us in the Christian fringe Christian community have heard of the Babylon working of Jack Parsons and yep. Elwood mm -hmm. back in 1947. Yep. And there are some who will look at that, that working and say that they opened a portal and somehow something came through and that led to what happened in the late forties. I mean, Israel became a nation, but we also had the Roswell incident and Kenneth Arnold with his UFO sighting and, you know, the modern UFO phenomenon really began right about the time of uh, yeah right right about the time of, of hubbard and uh, and uh, parsons but maybe it was lamb who got through you know could be. <laughs> yeah. or a evil twin brother you know ram or i don't know <laughs> yeah anyway, sorry yeah. but yeah that the interesting little uh yeah crowley uh, uh vision that he had there in the uh, the great pyramid but, but the way Mike put it, I thought was was really insightful. So look, look, if these entities that we're so afraid of have to wait for a couple of sexual deviants to do perverted sex rights in the desert to get permission to come in and into our time space domain, they're pretty lame. Right? Yeah. 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 How That's how scared should we be of these yeah, guys? Okay. If they're and, and waiting then on a couple of weirdo about, pervs. Yeah. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So okay. Um, but there are more and more people who are giving permission to these entities to yeah. take access. So the, the gates of hell, uh, this is the way the book is developing, will be, uh, you know, inside the heart of the individual in what the, you know, the, those who give permission yes. to these entities mm -hmm. to use them for their own purposes. And I think there are more oh, and more awesome. of them out there today. So that's, that's the gates of hell is right there. It really is. And you know, Jordan Peterson talks about that, how like the line between good and evil, it runs right down the middle of every human's heart. And that is, that is a very biblical concept in a lot of ways. And you feel it, you feel it when you're about to say something or do something, you know, when you are opening a door, mm -hmm. you know, and, and sometimes there's seminal moments in your life. And sometimes they're just a thousand, you know, moments throughout the day. But man, that's a cool book concept. I'm, I'm excited for that. Well, yeah, and and of course we will get into some of the uh, the locational things because, uh, as Jed Burton said, when you ask why this topic of the Nephilim is mm -hmm. is relevant today, and I asked yeah, him this yeah. in an interview a few months ago, and I I, I, I remembered this this answer because it really encapsulates it. Why should we as Christians care about the Nephilim? Why do the giants of Genesis six matter to us today? And Jed said two words: Caesarea Philippi. Really? Oh, yeah, that's that area right at the base of Mount Hermon with the giant cave called Panias or the Grotto of Pan. Oh, which wow. Is exactly where Jesus asked the disciples, well, who do they say the Son of Man is? Well, some say he's Elijah, some say he's this or that, a prophet or what. And then he said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for this man has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, a little wordplay here, you are Petros, Peter, and on this rock, this Petra, 9,200-foot mountain that we're standing right in front of, I will build my church in the gates of hell, which is this big cave right over here that everyone knows is the entrance to the netherworld, because that's what they thought back in the day. Will not prevail against it. Now we've had the opportunity to. Now, now here's the thing: when you read the Gospels in context, you understand that Jesus made a special trip to Caesarea Philippi to set up that 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 scene, that, 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 that exchange. Yeah. Because just prior to this, he had gone into the region of Tyre and Sidon, which are on the coast of Lebanon, mm -hmm. and he he healed the daughter of the Syrophoenician woman, and then he came back. Now, 
I had to look this up because, you know, again, this is where a little little research really opened some doors. Where were the roads in ancient Israel? Where were the Roman roads in ancient Israel? Well, it turns out there's a Roman road that runs from Tyre right past Dan and right past Caesarea Philippi, the Grotto of Pan, on the way over to Damascus. So Jesus could have said, hey, guys, while we're in the neighborhood, let's just go over here to the Grotto of Pan. I got something I want to do here. <laughs> no, they turned south and they went down to the Sea of Galilee, which is 30 miles away. Now, when you're walking, that's a two-day walk. So they went down to the Sea of Galilee and he, he fed 4,000, which is 4,000 men, plus their women, their wives and their children with like five loaves of bread. And he did some other healing in the vicinity of the Sea of Galilee. And then they walked back to Caesarea Philippi. It was a special trip. And Judd argues that based on the clues in the Bible, it may have been during the uh, annual Roman festival of um, uh, Lupercalia, which is a, was a major feast in the Roman calendar. Um, I don't know. But hmm. the point was, they did it right there at the base of Mount Hermon. And then according to the Gospels, like eight days later, he climbed a very high mountain with Peter, James, and John. And the only very high mountain in the vicinity of Caesarea Philippi is Mount Hermon. Wow. So climbs this mountain that was sacred to the creator god of the Canaanites, El, who, again, in the book, The Second Coming of Saturn, I argue, is Enlil, uh, Dagon, Molech, Saturn, Kronos, mm -hmm. Shemiyaza, etc., 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 was transfigured turned into a being of light and elisha and moses appear yeah it's like okay do you think the spirits in the spirit realm took notice of what was happening yeah that's what we call a power move yeah yeah <laughs> definitely a power move jesus was like that's so that's one of the greatest yeah, things about you know people are always you know the criticisms of jesus is that he's gentle you know he's jesus gentle meek and mild you know it's like dude, if you know what's <laughs> yeah. going on and you read no, this in the context yeah. you're supposed to you know Dude. It's like, uh, here I am. Come get some. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's got that warrior spirit, man. It's it's amazing the power. Yes. Yeah. Hey, and Derek. Um, I got a. I, we have a couple questions in the chat. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Do you mind if I put those up on the screen and, and oh, you please do. tackle them? Uh, the first one is from uh, Madeline Kimbrough. Let me throw this up here. Uh, what does Luke twenty one mean about signs in heaven? I think this is an, the Luke's version of the Olivet Discourse when Christ is talking about the signs of the times. And I think she's referring to Luke 21, 11, where it says, and earthquakes shall be in diverse places and famines and pestilences and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. That's a really good question. Uh, I don't know that I can answer that one with uh, authority. Um, I would suggest that uh, we will see things in the heavens that we've not seen previously. Um, I know Tom Horn has been writing and talking about uh, the dream that he had, the very vivid dream of the incoming asteroid Apophis, which is scheduled to make a very near pass of Earth officially on uh, April 13th of 2029. Uh, which so is a Friday the 13th, by the way. Yes, it is. And it's so close, it'll pass inside some of our, uh, some of the orbits of our, our satellites ar around Earth. Um Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it, it will uh, come through at about the time of Passover in 2029. And uh, so back up three and a half years, if this is Wormwood, as Tom believes it is, and if Wormwood arrives at the midpoint of the Great Tribulation, that means uh, October of 2025, during the mm -hmm. Feast of Tabernacles, yeah, would yeah. be the rapture for the if there is in fact a pre-tribulation rapture so but as, as far as great signs in heavens um yeah i don't know i think we will see things like comets and uh, other things in the skies that we've not seen previously um i don't think we can look for we're, we're not looking at uh, you know changes of uh, you know which is the ruling house in the zodiac or anything like that okay um, yeah I, I do think it's interesting though and uh you know, that, uh, again, the Olivet Discourse on the Mount of Olives, uh, given the connection between Mount Hermon and the Mount of Olives, was really significant. Yeah. Yeah, you actually go into that quite a bit in your book yeah. about the Mount of Olives yeah. and how... The symmetry. That was like the... I mean, it was all about the Mount of Olives. 
you know, you even argue that the that the Calvary was there, the resurrection, the ascension, all of those events were on the Mount of Olives, directly across from the Temple Mount. Right. Uh, and it has to do with uh, establishing that authority, like you did at Hermon, mm -hmm. uh, on a mountain where, and correct if I'm wrong, but altars to Molech and other gods had been built. Right. That's where the groves were. Yeah, Solomon did that, uh, and that's uh, documented in Second Kings that the rabbis referred to the Mount of Olives as the Mount of Corruption because of the high places that were put up there for Astarte, who is Anana, Ishtar, Aphrodite, uh, um, Chemosh, the god of the Mo uh, Moabites, who was uh, Ares of the uh, Greeks, Mars of the Romans, and um, Milcom, or Molech. Um, yeah. Milcom, chief god of the Ammonites, and I, I showed, again, the scholarly, peer-reviewed, secular research documenting that Milcom of the Ammonites, Molech to the Hebrews, was El of the Canaanites, this same entity whose mount of assembly was uh, Mount Hermon. Solomon put a high place up there in the Mount of Olives. Now, we've been blessed to go to Jerusalem, to go to Israel twice now. We're going back next March, and... We, you know, as part of the tour, of course, you go to the Mount of Olives, and uh, there's an overlook there where you can look down and you see the Temple Mount, and you realize the Mount of Olives is a couple hundred feet higher than the Temple Mount. Hmm. So, I mean, God chose hmm. at His Mount of Assembly, His, uh, in the Hebrew, the phrase is Har Moed, which is where John got the words for Armageddon. Uh, it's been mistranslated by English speakers into thinking that it has something to do with Megiddo. It's it's not. It's the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Yeah. You're looking down on God's mountain. The Mount of Olives is to the east. So the opening, the, the doors, the entry to the temple was to the east. So you open the doors of the temple and you look up in this mountain across the valley and there's a high place to, to Molech up there. And the valley that runs just south of the old city of Jerusalem is the Valley of Hinnom, where they would burn children to Molech. So, you know, it's it's astonishing that Solomon would do this. I mean, Solomon, when you read his story, God personally spoke to him in the temple that he just built. And before he died, he was building a temple on a higher mountain visible from the entry <laughs> to the mm -hmm. temple of Yahweh on this mountain yeah. across the way. What blew me away was looking at the Hebrew, and I'm not a Hebrew scholar or Hebrew speaker, so I had to consult with a friend who is a native Hebrew speaker, uh, Messianic Rabbi Zev Poret, um, the, the the phrase translated Mount of Corruption in 2 Kings is uh, Har Ha Mashkith. Well, Ha in Hebrew is the definite article the. So wait a minute. But we in English, we say Mount of Corruption. It's not Mount of the Corruption. So, all right, well, let's do a search. The Logos Bible Software, let's do a search for that phrase in Hebrew. Is it anywhere else in the Bible? Yeah, Ha Mashkith. It, yes, it shows up in Exodus. Book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 12, the destroyer, the destroying really? angel, went through is through Egypt, uh, smiting the firstborn, uh, the destroyer. So I asked Zev, uh, can you translate this hot mush Keith as Mount of the Destroyer? And he said, well, yeah, that that's actually, that makes sense. It's like, yeah. Okay, so you've got this entity who I believe was Shemiyaza, who is king of the titans, Kronos, Saturn, currently in the abyss, in the netherworld, in uh, Tartarus. Uh, and there's this entity called the Destroyer who comes out in Revelation 9, who's called uh, king over those in the bottomless pit. It seems to me that at least the circumstantial evidence points to this being one and the same. Yeah. So the Mount of the Destroyer, the Mount of Olives, and Jesus spent the, <laughs> the last week of his life on this earth dividing his time between the temple on the Temple Mount and teaching on the Mount of Olives. Wow. Yeah. So that could mean potentially that Shimyaza, you know, imprisoned in the abyss, could have been released temporarily to carry out God's judgment on Egypt. I, I don't think we're looking at the same entity there. Um, and did some reading on that because, yeah, that would be a difficult phrase to, uh, that would be difficult to square, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I know that there are some entities that are referenced in the Old Testament. For example, um, in Habakkuk 3, there's a reference to plague and pestilence following God as he's marching forth from Sinai, from Timon, leading Israel to the Promised Land. And uh, those are known entities in the Canaanite and Amorite pantheons. Uh, pestilence okay. is um, Dever, and uh, plague is, is Reshef, who is better known as Apollo. 
Oh, and it, yeah, and it would appear that they were limited to doing what God allowed them to do, sort of like dogs uh, on leashes. Uh -huh. But um, I would I would find it hard to believe that the destroyer of Exodus is the same entity that would be coming out of the abyss in Revelation nine. Okay, yeah, okay. I got uh, what you just said. They're like two different rabbit trails I want to go down because I really <laughs> want your opinion on something. I know. Uh, oh my gosh, this is so great. Okay, first of all, uh, the, the entity that did go through Egypt and kill the firstborn, isn't it interesting? Was the you said when, when we were talking earlier, the firstborn were the the ones who poured out the offering on behalf of the family to the dead. Yeah, oh, yeah. The house gods. The, yeah, yeah, they were the yeah, firstborn yeah, yeah. were the cup bearers. And that's right, what right. is that, that why it. they were is that why he chose firstborn you know i'd never thought about that but that's a really interesting connection yeah i wonder yeah. i wonder there because we were we, one of our questions in fact it was a very tangential one it was our last question was why did god choose the firstborn you know to die in the last you know in the plague of egypt and you know it's you understand you know the patriarchal nature and the cultural nature of the firstborn but just always kind of wondered is there something behind the scenes i wonder yeah. if it's not something yeah. like yeah. that yeah you need to do more research on that because the, the firstborn always had to be redeemed with a uh, another sacrificial animal in in the temple really but, um yeah but among the canaanites and amorites um boy sacrificing that firstborn child to uh baal haman which is just another name for Saturn, Kronos, El, Shemiaza. Shemiaza, yeah, was a thing. I mean, the the Egyptians. There are, there's that story in Second Kings where Jehoshaphat is uh, going to war against Misha, the king of Moab, and uh, he sacrifices Misha sacrifices his son on the wall of his city. But they've actually found an Egyptian inscription depicting an Egyptian army besieging a canaanite city and the canaanite defenders sacrificing children on the walls Whoa. so this wow. is no I mean, this is not just a thing where the bible you know the hebrew prophets were trying to make their uh neighbors look bad this this was known to the egyptians and uh yeah. the romans and the That's greeks crazy. knew this about their phoenicians uh about their Phoeni the, the phoenicians uh as well so uh yeah this was not a a thing that was made up to uh kind of sell judaism or christianity to the rest of the world this was a known practice in the ancient world yeah. well and it still persists to this day in so many different forms mm -hmm. you know whether it's you know something political like what we've been dealing with on the home front yep you know or wars you know i yep. mean we don't send our 40 year olds off to other countries That's we send point. our 17 18 19 year olds right. and uh and it's all through the occult you know i mean they made movies about it you know sacrificing children for the harvest you know uh yeah the Molech thing has been around it's, forever. It's very, it's very, it's a very, very old thing. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. it's sad. Um, yeah, and, and it continued into the Christian era. Uh, but uh, yeah. you know, you, you look at uh, you look you look at uh, the statistics uh, just from the last couple of years. The number one cause of death, and I mentioned this in the book, number one cause of death worldwide the last two years now is uh, abortion. Is it really? I believe it. Wow. Well, yeah, far, yeah, I guess so. Being the, first world the nations and yeah, yeah, the populations and yeah, it makes sense. And and it's such a pathological, it's it's such a destructive, anti-god sort of. Yeah, and if you look thing, at it through a supernatural, you know, uh, viewpoint. Yeah, when uh, you know there's anything to that sacrifice could sacrifice your own child. Yeah, for well, your what you betterment. see, what what you're seeing going on right now, uh, you know, with the Supreme Court and their opinion and and that changing somehow yeah when you see one side lose their freaking mind oh yeah how vitriolic yeah. they want right, yeah right. They, the just, temper they, they have to protect it and you're yeah. like it's almost evil like there's something oh, it's, supernatural it's behind it they're trying to protect it's very it. super right. it's you're taking right. away the sacrifices almost, yeah you're taking you are you're taking well i had a friend i i have a friend uh who is like as as like deep down the rabbit hole of weird things that you can't talk about at parties i am from nick this guy is that to, he is the tartarus to my to my earth you know and he made a very distinctive point you know about how uh i love this guy he's awesome um i can never get him on here but uh you know he made a very distinctive point about how uh abortion clinics you know everybody wears scrubs it looks like a ritual it it looks very similar to what you would see in mm -hmm. these ancient cultures you're in a specific room the woman lays on a on a table that very much seems like an altar 
and there's the doctor who's the head mm. priest everybody wears their scrubs and their you know their masks and they wore masks back then it's like it's it's changed a little bit you know because it's medical but mm. medical media yeah. you know yeah it, it just whatever you know there is uh, there is something incredibly supernaturally sinister and i know women who I know women who had the hardest time getting pregnant and, you know, they could never imagine, you know, someone doing that. I, I was just talking to a, a beautiful girl last night about this, about how she had to have an, uh, she was coerced into an abortion when she was younger and it wow. haunts her to this day. Mm. Oh, yeah. You yeah. know, and then I know other women who are not Christians who, you know, will uh, they're so grateful because they had an abortion because in their own words, I would not be able to have the life I have now if it weren't for, right. you know, mm. this termination that I did, wow. you know, and yeah. So the supernatural aspect is pretty prevalent. It, it's blatant, you know, in that topic. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I have another question for you related to yeah, Apollo. Good, because we bummed everybody out. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> but before it, but yeah, well, the, yeah, I mean, yeah, talk about Debbie Downer. Welcome to the uh, Goslings. Yeah, yeah, get prepared right. to get bummed. <laughs> uh, but before I ask my question, there was another chat question by uh, Ann, uh, Ann Creighton. Creighton or Crichton, yeah. And uh, this is interesting. It has to do with, uh, in Psalm 8, uh, it says a man was made a little lower than the angels. Uh, and the New American Standard translates it a little lower than God. What do you? What does Derek think of this? Well, um, it's we we had a really interesting discussion, Sharon and I, with Timothy Alberino a while back about his book Birthright, and he pointed out something that I thought made a lot of sense. I, I think it's because of the the sense in, in the ancient world, in the sense that we still have this this day, that uh, heaven is you know up there, the netherworld is down there. And we occupy sort of the, well, Middle Earth, if you will. Mm -hmm. And we were created to have dominion over this realm, whereas the angels were created to have dominion over uh, the spirit realm. And so I think that is maybe at the heart of this rebellion by some of these, these supernatural entities. Because they, they look at this realm and see us as limited and flawed because we can't do what they do in terms of moving between dimensions. We are not eternal, at least not in this form. The fact is we are all eternal beings. It's just well, we, we can't take anything. any form we want like they can. Yeah. We, don't, yeah, exactly. we don't have the supernatural powers that they have. You know, the, the uh, theology of the, uh, uh, the prophecy movies with um, Christopher mm -hmm. Walken, yeah, Russell I mean, Wong. Theology, but uh, yeah, but the way Walken portrays Gabriel, you know, as yeah. uh, we're just a bunch of monkeys, is yeah. probably close to the way some of these rebellious angels see us. We're just uh -huh. creatures of mud. Yeah. And yet, God created us and gave us dominion over this beautiful planet. I think and that was the exact phrase that Viggo Mortensen used when he played Lucifer in those movies. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that, yeah. that, scene where he eats gabriel's heart and then squeals with delight is like Wah. oh yeah it's and it almost makes you uh, you know wonder which is creepier that or when he's talking to virginia madsen i think it's virginia madsen and he eats the he eats the flower you know and it's just the symbology of yeah anyways yeah yeah but, but it's uh, right but there is a, a a verse in first corinthians i believe it's first corinthians 6 if i remember right yes uh first corinthians 6 3 do you not know that we Mm -hmm. or to judge angels mm -hmm. yeah. so not only are our elder brothers the angels looking at us and like lord why did you make them this way and why did you give them dominion over this beautiful place mm -hmm. and then why are you creating them to why are they going to have the right to judge us i think some of the uh, the fallen realm decided that that just wasn't going to happen and they were going to take steps to try to stop that mm, so yeah. yeah we've been made lower than the angels for now but uh day is coming first corinthians 15 read that chapter read that chapter because it is a summary of christian theology the gospel by which you are being saved in the first 
three verses of 1 Corinthians 15. Then he goes into the uh, apologetics and how we can know that Jesus Christ was literally raised from the dead. He appeared first to Peter and then to James and then to the 12 and then to 500 brothers at once, some of whom have died, but most are still awake. In other words, hey, church at Corinth, don't believe me about this resurrection thing. Yeah, it's kind of unbelievable, but there are still witnesses walking around 20 years later. Send somebody to Jerusalem and ask around. Yeah. The rest of the chapter is why resurrection is so important, because we're going to be raised up in incorruptible bodies, yeah. where we will become like them. And then Hebrews chapter 2, where Jesus introduces us to the divine council, and we're, we're there for the, the most awesome concert in all of history, and there's <laughs> ways of interpreting it, but uh, Hebrews 2 cites Psalm 8. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while, a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection mm. under his feet. And then you go down to verse uh, 12. I will tell of your name to my brothers. Think about this. The day when we are introduced to the divine council. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. Yeah. Man. Powerful. Well, uh, that, yes, we've been made a little lower than the angels for now. For a little and while. We are resurrected. Yeah, and it's wow. think about the 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 parable of the the. Um, it's the, the prodigal son. It is the it's prodigal. Jacob and Esau. It's mm -hmm. you know these parallels. It, exactly. Yeah. Yes. We will be welcomed back home, even though we're covered in yeah. pig mess. And the <laughs> elder brothers, the elder brother is like, "What well, we've been here faithful to you the whole time. Yeah. What are what are we? It's like, hey, look, you've got your inheritance. Yeah. Be glad. Be joyful that." Yeah. He was lost and now is found. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's an amazing story. Mm. Timothy helped us understand that in his book Birthright. Highly recommended. But when you yeah. understand that these that some of the parables that Jesus taught, you know, we we've been taught. You know, we heard them since Sunday school, and it's oh, like, yeah. okay, this means we're supposed to forgive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there's a much bigger story here. The parable of the wicked tenants. You know, the tenants who are uh, mm -hmm. given charge of a, of a vineyard because the owner is far away and they're not paying the rent that's due and so they send the, the owner sends a uh, somebody to collect and they beat him and another guy comes they beat him up and they send a third guy and they kill him and so the owner says ah i know i'll send my son they'll listen to him and so the wicked tenants say ah if we kill the heir we will inherit the vineyard how does that make any sense mm-hmm it doesn't. Well, of course, they, they do. And Jesus asks the Pharisees and the scribes who are there, you know, what's going to happen when the owner comes from this faraway land? Well, these uh, these guys will be destroyed. And then they perceived that Jesus was talking about them and they got really mad. But they weren't. He wasn't talking about them. He was talking about the principalities and powers behind them. Right. Yeah. The puppet masters, the yes. ones controlling the scenes. Yes, that's exactly yeah. it. So, yeah, there, there's a lot more in the Bible when you realize that this war has been ongoing since Eden yeah. and even before. Yeah. And we're in the middle. We're the prize in all of this, really. Yeah. 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 Well, that kind of takes me to a question about Apollo. You know, in Daniel, uh, Gabriel is it comes to Daniel and saying, I was trying to get to you. I was oh, interrupted yeah. by the Prince of Persia. Yep. When I'm done giving you my message, I'm going to go off to fight the Prince of Greece. He's talking about these principalities that rule over these empires. Mm -hmm. And it makes me wonder, could Apollo potentially be the entity that is currently over the American empire? Oh, yeah. What's the principality of America? That's a really good question. I would argue that it's Satan. Really? The accuser yeah, we, himself? We, we think that storm god, Satan, the king... Uh, who has a kingdom, according to Jesus, is um, the one who emerged as the major power over Western civilization. That he was smart enough to perceive that with the, the emergence of the Greeks in the, uh, say, 4th century B.C. under Alexander, and then the Roman Empire, which emerged really in the 2nd century B.C., that uh, things were moving further to the West. I think the Prince of Persia is another entity who is aligned against him. I would suggest that the, there's a principality over Russia who is um, yeah. stands in opposition to to this entity. I, I Now, again, this is speculative, and I'm not going to you know go out and say that this is the way it is, and this is how we have to orient our theology, because there's no way to know. Like you know, Paul said, we're seeing in, we're looking into a mirror into a room with insufficient light. Right. Yeah. 
Okay. In, glass, glass, glass darkly. darkly. Yeah. But when you consider that the, the so-called temple of America, the United States Capitol, this temple of democracy, you know, Liz Cheney called it the most sacred space in our democracy. It's like, no, that would be your prayer closet, except right. I don't know whether she has one, but that mm -hmm. would be it if that was it. She's got a um, closet. <laughs> sorry. I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> We can cut that from the from the podcast. Well, we'll, I'll get that. I'll get that in post. I'll cut that in post. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> but uh, when you consider that the reason it's called the Capitol, C A P I T O L, as yeah. distinguished from Capitol with an A L, is because that's the name of the Temple of Jupiter, who remember is just the Roman name for the storm god who Jesus identified as Satan. That's the name of his temple in Rome, the Capitolium. I had always wondered that. And no one ever has a good explanation for that in school, by the way. When you're growing up, no one ever talks about why it's Capitol, not Capitol. Yeah, yeah. And, no, it, it's well know, known. It just is, you know. I mean, yeah. The architect, Pierre Charles L'Enfant and Thomas Jefferson, when they were laying out Washington, D.C. in 1799, this is setting aside all the Freemasonic symbolism built into the streets. I, I didn't even go into that in the book because Tom Horns covered that really well. But... Why is the Capitol the Capitol? That's something Tom didn't get into in uh, uh, Zenith 2016, uh, Polygon Rising 2012. You know, it, why it, in these letters that are preserved at the Library of Congress, Jefferson and L'Enfant went back and forth. L'Enfant wanted to call it Congress House. Okay, no. that makes sense. In 1799, there was not a single, no, I take it back. There was only one building on earth where a legislative body met that was called the Capitol, and that was the state of Virginia and their legislative building in Williamsburg. But Jefferson, again, I, I, I'm not saying Thomas Jefferson was a Satanist or anything like that. I just don't think he really thought this through. Right. He wanted to evoke the glory of Rome. Hmm. Yeah. In fact, if, if, if I remember correctly, the little... Uh, stream that comes into the Potomac there was uh, they were calling it the Tiber if I'm not mistaken but I'd have to look that up anyway oh, yeah. he insisted that it be called the Capitol for the Temple of Jupiter in Rome yeah. and so it is and so now we got like 38 out of the 50 states here in the Union where our legislative bodies meet in a building called the Capitol because that's the name of the Temple of Jupiter in ancient Rome which interestingly wow called the Capitol because it was on the Capitoline Hill, and it was called the Capitoline Hill because on Mons Saturnus, the Mount of Saturn, <laughs> in the 5th century BC, when the last king of Rome, whose name was Tarquin the Proud, was uh, digging the foundation for the what would become the Temple of Jupiter, they found a severed head. No way. Yeah. Now, Tarquin was an Etruscan. The Etruscans were the descendants of the survivors of the Trojan War, the Trojans who fled west. And uh, according to their religion, severed, severed heads, heads. Yes. was how you communicated with the dead. Yeah. It was yeah. considered a good omen. And so they renamed Mons Saturnus and moved the Temple of Saturn from the top of the hill down to the bottom, just like Saturn had been demoted by Jupiter and kicked down to Tartarus. They put the Capitoline, or the, the, the Temple of Jupiter on top of the Capitoline Hill. I mean, in, wow. in Latin, the word for head is caput, like, you know, the capo, mm -hmm. the boss, and the mafia, the head. Yeah. So that's why Capitol Hill, decapitation, right. That's why in uh, Washington, D.C., the United States Capitol is on Capitol Hill. Wow. It's all named for some unnamed guy who lost his head in ancient Rome 20 <laughs> years ago. And because the practice back in the day was that's yeah, how you yeah. communicated with the dead. And uh, again, our legislative body meets in a building named for the Temple of Satan. Yeah, that communicates with the dead via <laughs> severed heads. Wow. Welcome to your government. Yeah. <laughs> man well, and, and then there are texts from ancient Ugarit that refer to the Rephaim the spirits of the giants destroyed in the flood as the warriors of Baal the warriors. and they would try to uh, if I remember correctly from your book they would try to invoke those spirits or get them to do favors for them or help them you know witchcraft sort of stuff and uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and it, if I remember correctly that civilization, correct me if I'm wrong on this, that civilization, according to your book, ended 
a thousand years before Sargon of Akkad. Is that the one, or uh, was it, um, or was it another one? Sargon um, Sargon arose around 2300 BC 2400 BC in that time frame I don't remember the exact year but uh, yeah, it yeah. was around that time the Hurrians began building at uh, their city of Urkesh in northern uh, Mesopotamia around 3500 BC okay but the Hurrians yeah. continued down into the biblical time I mean uh, in the Bible they're just called Horites oh that's right okay mm -hmm. yeah that's a that's a fascinating thing about the more you know archaeological stuff that occurs the more it ties in with the bible the more it's validated in the biblical text and much older than what you know people i mean gobekli tepe they couldn't they couldn't cover that one up man that threw the curve from that kind of changed the narrative and the narratives kept changing since then you know and it kind of dovetails back with graham hancock and his theory yeah. about the water erosion on the Sphinx, you know, which is 12,500 years ago. And just there's eventually they're not going to be able to. It's it's a bowl overflowing and they're not going to be able to keep the water. In well, the what's way. really interesting about Gobekli Tepe is there's new research that's just been published within the last year or so now that uh, shows that there was a, a skull cult at Gobekli Tepe and some of the other sites around there. They've, there's a site. There's like a collection of a dozen sites around the plains of Haran, which is where Abraham was called from, interestingly, coincidentally, I think not, called mm -hmm. Tas Teple, which means uh, the Stone Hills. So there are a dozen sites like Gobekli Tepe, all within like 120 miles of Haran, and uh, we're, we're going there in October. Oh, you're and, right. uh, oh, oh yeah, man. yeah, we're, we're taking a tour there in October. Uh, so we still have openings um, for people who are interested. Skywide. Eric, can we go? Um, <laughs> No, I'm kidding. That's awesome. Wow. Uh, and and uh, the, the archaeology museum in San Liurfa is uh, one of the places where they've collected artifacts from there and from Karahan Tepe nearby, which is uh, even older than Gobekli Tepe. But there's another site called Kayanu where archaeologists have excavated a site that they call the Skull Temple or the Skull Building, hmm. like 100 human skulls. And when they test it, what is this discoloration on uh, this? This uh, must be the altar here. Oh, it's it's human blood. No okay. Way. Wow. So, yeah. Hmm. Well, even Golgotha uh, is oh, yeah. the skull, the cap of the skull, is right? Or the crown of the skull. And our, our friend uh, Messianic Rabbi Zev Porat argues, based on his research, that uh, as it mentions in the Old Testament, David took the head of Goliath back to Jerusalem with him, oh, and he yeah. believes that he was buried on the Mount of Olives. Hence, Golgotha. It's not just place of the skull; it's a place of Goliath's skull. Oh wow! Ooh, that's interesting. That's awesome. That's okay. It's so yeah. much. I, I'm just shocked uh, this to to hear that everything really ties back to the Mount of Olives. Yeah, because we always assume these were different places. These mm -hmm. were all different spots on the map. Armageddon. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Megiddo. Megiddo. You yeah. know, uh, Golgotha. Yeah. The traditional, uh, the traditional site of the crucifixion and, mm -hmm. and tomb and. Uh, but you but but you have connected everything to uh, to show pretty clearly that it was all the Mount of Olives yeah. directly opposed to or Mount across. Hermon. Yeah, well, directly opposed from the Temple Mount, oh, where the Temple yeah. was. Yeah, uh, you know, right there, looking looking down on Jerusalem and mm -hmm. in God's Temple. Uh, man, that's crazy. I have I have a question about um, Apollo. I think in your book, Giants, Gods, and Dragons. Uh, you, mm -hmm. we didn't know we were going to talk about two books, <laughs> uh, but you, 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 something was really, really interesting that I, that I, uh, read of yours a couple weeks ago. Uh, you kind of conjecture that the first seal has potentially been opened already. Oh. Yeah. Uh, and that the, that's the right, the, the first four seals of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. uh, and the first one is the rider on the white horse. And you show very well in your book that that's that would have been understood as the first century Jew or Christian when they read that they'd be that's Apollo, that's Apollo. And there is a parallel. I never knew this until two weeks ago. Read the Bible all my life. There's a parallel uh, prophecy. Is it in Zechariah or Ezekiel? I can't remember which, but it's the same thing. There are four, four horsemen. There are four horsemen. Four chariots. Four horsemen. Same right. colors. Mm -hmm. And the one that's white goes to the west. Oh really? And uh, you're you, you conjecture that Apollo might be Western civilization, yeah, led by the U.S. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, we uh, and, and again, this goes back to David W. Lowe in another book that he read that was really influential on us called Earthquake Resurrection. Uh, and uh, I, I highly recommend that one because that'll help clarify a lot of understanding of end times prophecy at earthquakeresurrection.com. Okay. He argued that the first five seals have been opened. And it makes sense when you read Revelation chapters 4, 5, and 6 that uh, John is in heaven. He's taken up to the throne room of God, and uh, there's an angel calling out, you know, who is worthy to open the seals, and uh, no one is found worthy Interestingly, in heaven, on the earth, or under the earth, who's worthy to open hmm. the uh, the seals, the scroll. And so John weeps, and then suddenly a lamb who was slain, that's a representation of Jesus, appears between the four guardian creatures, those are the cherubim, and the throne, and God himself. And he begins opening the seals. And, okay, we know from the book of Acts that when Stephen was being stoned, he saw one like the Son of Man at the right hand of God. Okay, that's Jesus. Paul writes in the books of Ephesians and uh, the author of the book of Hebrews writes as well that Jesus is already in heaven at the right hand of the Father. So we know that within the first decade or so, at least, according to the eyewitnesses there and the uh, testimony of the apostles, that Jesus was already in heaven. So just like in Revelation 12, where John is shown the vision of the woman clothed in the sun with her feet in the moon, and she uh, you know, gives birth to a, a man-child who will rule the nations with a rod of iron— Okay, that's a view of the past because that's the birth of Jesus. So John wasn't seeing everything in Revelation in the future. Some of these things were in the past, and we argue that this was in the past because as of, what, three years after the resurrection when Stephen was being stoned and persecuted by Paul, he said he saw Christ at the right hand of the Father. Right. So we argue the first horseman, the rider on the white horse, is Apollo. Um, there are some good clues there, like uh, he's uh, an archer, like... Uh, Apollo was. He was a plague god who spread plague with his with his bow and arrow. Uh, the bow, the Greek word is toxon, from where, which we get toxic, uh. toxicity and so forth. Only place in the uh-huh. Bible that's used, which means, as Mike Heiser says, it's weird. And if it's weird, it's important. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. That's <laughs> so true. Is that, uh, he's got a crown. And we think, okay, crown, we know what that is, the thing you wear on your head. What kind of a crown? The Greek word is Stephanos. It's a crown of victory. This is the crown that was given to winners in the the uh, Olympic Games. Mm-hmm. The crown that became the symbol of the Roman emperors who identified with Apollo. Right. right. Now, this is to be distinguished from the diadem, which is a crown of royalty. Mm-hmm. Right. What the rider on the white horse in Revelation 19, who is the Messiah, Jesus, oh, he wears many true. diadems. That's different from this crown, this Stephanos. And in Greek cosmology, Apollo was the one who invented the Stephanos. He was chasing a uh, a river nymph named Daphne who didn't resist his, his advances and prayed to her father, a river god, who changed her into a laurel tree. So to honor her, Apollo created this wow. crown of rain, and that became the Stephanos, the crown of victory. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So the second seal, the red horse, uh, this is war, that's Ares, Mars, that was pretty easy. Uh, the fourth seal, death, Thanatos, that's what started this whole line of thinking. Sharon said, you know, if Thanatos, who is a Greek entity known in their pantheon, who are the other three? Oh, okay. Well, yeah. let's start researching that. The rider on the black horse was a little more difficult, but uh, when we started digging into it, we concluded that this was probably the Babylonian god Nabu, who was uh, Hermes to the Greeks and Mercury to the Romans. Um, Mercury is based on the same Latin word from which we get merchant and mercantile, merchandise. Mm -hmm. You know, he's the god of the god of commerce. That's another word based on that root, but also the god of scribes. In ancient Babylon, people were illiterate, and so they would have to go to the scribal class who worshipped Nabu, to uh, write down things like wills and letters and contracts and so forth. Uh, Nabu was the one who also tracked what was given to the temple. Tracked, you kept the ledgers, in other words. Hmm. And uh, interestingly enough, back in 2009, you remember the uh, the great real estate collapse after 08? Yeah, oh yeah. 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 Um, the good folks at MasterCard instituted a new fee that merchants have to pay every time somebody swipes a MasterCard. It's like a two-cent charge that they have to pay. They could have called it anything. An internet. What did they fee. call it? They called it the Network Access Brand Usage. I knew it. The Nabu, Nabu fee. 
Uh -huh. the MasterCard, two cents goes to Nabu. Oh, wow. My gosh. Yeah. So that, that's where we came up with this idea that these entities were known in the first century to Greeks, Romans, Jews, Christians. They would have known who these entities were and who John was referring to. Yeah. So uh, it doesn't just symbolize war. It doesn't just symbolize economic servitude, debt yeah. servitude. It, it is the spirit behind it. And uh, so that's that we, we think is going on. But they're, they're limited in what they can do until the restrainer is removed that Paul writes about to the church at Thessalonica. Mm -hmm. So uh, for now, they can wreak havoc, but uh, only on a limited scale. When the right. uh, restrainer is removed, all hell breaks loose in a very yeah. literal sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, was, Nabu, uh, was Nabu worshipped in Babylon? Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. They found, See, I wonder, they found a temple to uh, Nabu in ancient Babylon just not long ago, within the last decade or so, which was literally dedicated to Nabu of accounts. Huh. See, I wonder, this is just like a total philosophical um, or ideological rabbit trail, but I wonder if there's not like a link between Babylonian usury, you know, and then this, this um, the writing and the, uh, you know, the administering of nabu and then also how that contradicts a high trust culture where your word is your bond because when you're writing things if you're writing a contract down it's because you don't trust the other party to just you know speak the truth speak the word you know speak logos put logos mm. into the world you know yeah. and um and so instead of doing that you live in a low trust culture where things have to be Hmm. written down and there is a there is a spiritually or psychologically toxic nature to to that that i guess might tie into the whole Maybe. usury lending debt system um, well, i'll tell you if the uh, world is not uh, ruled today by lawyers accountants and bankers i don't know who does run it yeah. <laughs> right yeah, yeah. no kidding yeah if you want to get anything done get the lawyer yeah. you know because the institution is not going to listen to you <laughs> until you do um Okay, so we're we're coming up on two hours. Mm -hmm. um, what do we do? We still have time for a couple questions, or do we need to let you go, Derek? What works best for you? Well, like I said, it's usually about this time of the evening. I check in on my eighty-five-year-old mom. So, uh, oh, okay, gotcha, <laughs> awesome. We get a couple of questions. I, I can uh, take them quick, but uh, this sure. is a fun conversation. So, uh, you know, I, this I has have, been so great. Yeah. yeah. This has been awesome. Um, so uh, I just wanted to ask real quick if you had any information on this. You've talked about how the Christmas star is a conflation of, um, of you know, the aligning of uh, Jupiter to create the Aquarian age. Um, but in the Bible, there still was the star that led the, the wise men to what do you think the actual Christmas star was? Not the one that they say it was right. you, a couple of years ago. Well, um Dr. E.L. Martin uh, wrote a book about this called The Star That Astonished the World some years back, and you can find it for free online. There was a, um, and I mentioned this in the book, I think, Sharon and I did a program on this for our Unraveling Revelation program um, last Christmas, I think. There was a, uh, there were a couple of conjunctions in the year 3 B.C. that were probably what the, the wise men saw. One of them was a conjunction between Jupiter and Venus in Virgo. And uh, Venus, of course, is the representation of Inanna, Ishtar, Aphrodite, Astarte, etc. And uh, so the idea that this virgin was, you know, that it was, was going to be giving birth right. to the heir to the king. Yeah. And then later that year, there was a conjunction between Jupiter and the star Regulus, which is the king star in the constellation Leo, you know, Regulus, Rex, king. Uh -huh. And that appears to have been on or about September 11th of 3 BC, if I remember correctly. Mike Heiser wrote about this, and that's where I heard about E.L. Mm. Martin. Now, he was part of um, Herbert W. Armstrong's Worldwide Church of God, which had some deviant theology but uh, on this his research seems to be good and i cite el martin actually on his research on the uh, location of the crucifixion site being the mount of olives so oh, uh, some of his other stuff at his website there is uh, really really good but that's probably what it was these uh, conjunctions that were read by the wise men from the east and 
did they come all the way from from what is now uh, Persia, Iran? Don't know. It's possible they may have just been on the east side of the Jordan River, but uh, they spotted these signs and interpreted what they meant. It was not this uh, this conjunction of of Jupiter and Saturn, which was put forward by Johannes Kepler, who was the famous uh, astronomer oh, yeah. of the 17th century, uh, looking for a naturalistic explanation. What is it they might have seen mm -hmm. that would have confused these primitive, simple men of centuries right. gone by? Yeah, just a little condescending there, Johannes. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. well, these guys understood the sign and understood the prophecies of the Old Testament and knew, based on the timing yeah. of the prophecies, that they were getting near the end of that age. Um, boy, Ken Johnson, Josh Peck have done some wow. really good work on the uh, calendars of the Essenes and the understanding that the early Christians, based on the Essenes, who were some of the first Christians, had of what these signs meant. They knew they were getting near the end of the age of the patriarchs and beginning the age of grace, the 2000 years that began with the coming of the Messiah. So I think there's a correlation there, but I've not researched mm -hmm. it thoroughly. But again, yeah. based on the work of E.L. Martin and the star that astonished the world, the date of Jesus' birth was probably September 11th of 3 BC. That gives that, me chills. Yes, that's right. That I've gives that me before. chills. Yeah. That's why it happened on September 11th. It was yep. another desecration. Yep. You know, yeah. God, yeah. hey. for the fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. <laughs> uh -huh. That's uh -huh. the thing, man. You know, they want you to they want you to think that the stars and the planets rule you. But no, the stars are simply signs of things that the Lord has control over. Yes, sir. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Dude, that's awesome. This has been so much fun. Man, Derek, Thank you, you have so much you have really time. been an awesome guest. And uh, Nick mom is in the chat. She's yeah, watching. Yep, yep, She's my, super my, excited. She's yep, a mega fan. Yep absolutely yeah. i've been talking to her about this for weeks we've been so excited well thank uh, you thank you yeah thank you thank you for taking the time and yeah. being so generous too. two hours is, i mean that's just fantastic yeah. thank you for that and uh we'll let you go yeah uh, so you can call you, your you, mom call your mom and enjoy <laughs> your family on memorial day weekend yeah. and man we would love some point in the future to do this again because we're gonna we have even more questions and, oh, you, and you have lots of books that we still need to read <laughs> that's right so. yeah well, yeah. likewise, uh, and one of these days, I have to get you on to uh, my podcast, A View from the Bunker, to talk about uh, how you're trying to reach out through your writing to audiences. I mean, we're all shooting at, you know, di different uh -huh. targets. You're aiming at different targets and just yep. using the gifts with which we've been blessed. So uh, okay. we'd How's love that? to do that. So I'll be in touch yeah, about that. It. Yeah, that sounds great. We'd honored. love that, man. That'd be fantastic. Uh, Derek Gilbert, yep. author of The Second Coming of yep. Saturn, amongst many other books. Derek, real quick, website, um, where's the best place for people to find you? Well, uh, gilberthouse.org is the site where Sharon and I sort of have everything. gilberthouse.org, we do our weekly Bible study there and uh, put that up as a podcast. But we just, within the last few weeks, have launched a more, I guess, concerted effort to uh, be organized. GilbertHouse.org, and from there you can get our mobile app, which includes all of our content, which is the weekly Bible study, our weekly video program, Unraveling Revelation, our weekly program, Sci Friday, and uh, my weekly podcast, A View from the Bunker, all of that uh, on the app. And we've also got a Roku channel and uh, Apple TV, and you can find those links at GilbertHouse.org as well. Man, you are you everywhere. Are everywhere. I know. You are so everywhere. Awesome. Yeah. Such <laughs> a power so couple. Awesome. You guys yeah. are the greatest. Well, uh, you're very kind. Thank you. You bet. Yeah. Thank you, Derek. This has been a treat, man. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, God, God bless. Thank you again, and we look forward to talking again soon. You bet. All right. Bye.